Well, welcome to the Republican Professor on November 11th, Veterans Day. We have Jeremy Rivera with us, an honored guest indeed. Thanks for being here, Jeremy. Thanks for having me, Lucas. Good to see you, brother. It's great to see you too, man. Thank you. I like the uh, the hat. Yeah. In honor of Veterans Day and, and every day. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. I switched the hat out at the last minute. I was like, you know what? It's Veterans Day. I'm going to do the Navy hat. Plus, it matches my, you know, what I had on. Yes. So uh, I, always, I always try to send a, send a text to my uncles who served and my dad. Um, everyone. Oh. Most, it seems like everyone, you know, served in my family, it seems oh. like. But um, yeah, I had two uncles in Vietnam. Um, mm. pretty, pretty intense. Saw a lot of action. Army. One was a parrot. Like, I don't know what his role exactly was, but he would jump out of helicopters into the jungle with a M16. And yeah, he was uh, he was in the thick of it for sure. So I wow. always send him a text, thank him for his service. And Is that on your dad's side or your mom's side? That's my my dad's side, my my dad's brother. Yeah. And my uncle Larry as well. He was also in Vietnam. Both on your dad's side? Yep. Yep. And my dad was in the Navy. Oh wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I've known you for a long time. Gosh, since uh Colorado Elementary School. <laughs> wow. Is it that that's like what third grade, second, third grade? I think I was on C track and you were on B track or something like that. I didn't even know what that <laughs> was, but right. I heard that Colorado is closing down now. Did you hear that? Oh, I did not hear that. Yeah. I mean, I don't know I if that's true that, or not, I did, but I did hear a lot of schools are closing in Jefferson County. Yeah. Well, we grew up in uh Littleton, Colorado, little town called Littleton, Colorado. Do you say Colorado or Colorado? I say Colorado. Me too. And sometimes you just say Ratto. The 303, baby. That's right. Ratto. I have a 303 area code still for my Do number. You? For my phone okay. number, yeah. Nice. Yep. Yeah. And my social security number is 303 area code. Totally kidding. I'm kidding. I was just like, wow. <laughs> you should be like a 5 I'm going a little bit too far on the Colorado <laughs> thing. <laughs> so, uh, Jer... Do you go by Jer still? Because it seems like I called you Jer growing up. I go by Jer with people who knew me from before. Okay. You know, it's almost like if you knew me from like childhood, you you still call me Jer. Yeah. Maybe even, even high Jer. school. But 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 Jeremy is is what I've gone by since after college, probably. It's it's my real name. So and I don't like the name Jerry, so I don't want Jer to be mistaken for Jerry. Mm. just not a jerry no so jerry works or jeremy but not yeah. jerry gotcha yeah i've never thought of you as a jerry <laughs> <laughs> i've always thought of you as just jer right you know you're Jer. Yeah. that's jer over there you know right yeah so wrestling um you know those three so syllable names can be difficult for some people <laughs> so we went we grew up together going to well i guess we went to the same junior high school too people call it middle school now but we called it junior high deer creek right yeah and um i guess we have now enough people enough information for people to steal your identity we have chatfield chatfield high school chargers yeah. <laughs> there's somebody's security question right there on their whatever <laughs> yeah. right uh, uh and you I, were, I usually do what was the name of your first pet oh yeah yeah well then and then so i went into the navy after chatfield you went to college and kind of a funny story i was stationed in i was stationed in in hawaii you know um within like two years after high school I went through two years of training and then i got to hawaii in 1995 and uh i went to this i thought it was like a random church on the island uh because it was on a different side of the island mm -hmm. that i lived on i lived in the middle of the island near mililani for people who know oahu 
and um what's called we was called wheeler army airfield at the time and uh that's where i was living and wahiwa another another name and uh i go to hope chapel kaneohe um there next to marine corps base kaneohe that's how i always think of it on the other side of the island and it's a friday night and i see jer there and i only knew you from colorado at that time and here we are in the middle of the freaking ocean in in the middle of this island and you're there and I never thought of you as uh, particularly religious or, you know, I never doubted you like we're kind of spiritual, but like, I didn't think mm -hmm. of you as like a churchgoer, I guess I was going to say. Yeah. Like, I didn't think of you as a pagan, but I didn't think of you as like, I'm, I go to church on a Friday night in college. Right. And uh, there you were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. It was... Uh... Well, first of all, Hope Chapel was a great church. And I had, you know, it's because when you knew me when I was younger, I was Catholic and was raised okay. kind of quasi Catholic. My mom was Catholic. My dad never was. Then my parents divorced when I was about seven. And, uh, but was raised, you know, sacramentalized in the church, I like to say. I was never evangelized, but I was sacramentalized. And um, mm -hmm. it wasn't until my freshman year of college that I did at CU Boulder that I came to, you know, a more personal relationship, as we would say in evangelical circles with God through Christ. And then I moved to Hawaii the next year. And that's ironic for Boulder. Jeez. Yeah. Well, that's I mean, not the first thing, thing that people light think travels of. furthest in the darkness or something, or mm -hmm. light shines brightest in the darkness. Right. I Do mean, you think of Boulder as a dark place. Spiritually. Yes. Absolutely. I it's, you know, it's, it's, um, there's such an emphasis on nature there. You know, there's a, there's a Catholic teaching that I really love. It says that grace builds on nature because nature by itself leads to corruption. And I like that because grace builds on nature means that God just meets you where you are. Right. And that's kind of our challenge is to try to meet people where they are, wherever they are. And then, and then grace invites them to take the next step. Right. But you need that kind of like, heavenly help you need that supernatural help that grace right but mm -hmm. but grace by itself leads to corruption and what i mean by that is like it's kind of like a, a good analogy would be like fruit on the vine that just stays there too long you mean so you said nature itself leads to corruption Na nature by itself leads yeah. to corruption gotcha yeah yeah so yeah so that's right he meets, yeah, yeah. meets you where you are right great grace you know but but it's like it's like fruit that's been on the vine too long and it gets it, it gets overripe and then it rots. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I would kind of describe Boulder. It's it's got good intentions with being natural and <laughs> you know doing yoga and eating your oats and berries and mm -hmm. your vegan diet or your you know, whatever it is. But when that's <laughs> all there is and there isn't a supernatural connection to it, it you know, it becomes really just the other side of the coin. It's the yeah. bourgeois bohemians who are protesting, who drive off in their rage. You know. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, interesting. Do you think that that's yeah, an how... interesting place? I mean, I love, it. I love it. Just, yeah. Um, well, beautiful. I mean, just it, so beautiful. Yeah, it, it isn't. Naturally, it's nice. I guess you know. It's got a lot of potential is what I would say. It's got a lot of potential. seems like a lot of, I haven't spent a lot of time up there. Exactly. I taught there uh, for a semester as an assistant, a teaching assistant at a place called day spring, hmm. which was for CU credit. It was philosophy okay. and it was a house in Boulder right off the campus. And um it was run by Dayspring uh, Christian Ministry of some kind. It was a philosophy of religion class. Yeah, so we had CU Boulder students there, and it was very interesting. Um, that was under the direction of Dave Horner and Kate Wadler. Kate Wadler went off to get her PhD at Cornell. And I don't know what she's doing right now, actually. And mm -hmm. then uh dave horner now he was he was finishing his doctorate at oxford at the time now he teaches at biola and he was my professor so 
Yeah, that was an interesting place. And that was my closest look at Boulder. Uh, to me, it just felt like, I just felt like a dark presence there. So, yeah, but um, yeah, the nature connection, I can see that. Yeah, that was good. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt about Monterey too. A little bit mm. of the same stuff, Monterey kind of Berkeley stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, so Jer, how did you end up in Hawaii then? I was ordered to go there by the government. <laughs> how did you get there? So it was. And okay. All right. We lost the connection, but we're back. Okay. So we were talking about, Jeremy, how you got to uh, Hawaii. Yeah, so I did my freshman year at CU Boulder. And then um, my childhood best friend and I had had a dream to go to study either in California on the beach or Hawaii. I, don't, I think you remember Troy. And so um, Troy and I grew up together and never had a chance to go to school together other than preschool. And um, but we had a very similar path. that Our parents split up around the same time. We both moved both didn't really quite fit in, you know, in a sense. And then we both became kind of leaders where we were in high school athlete athletes as well. And then I was a year older. So the plan was I'll go to a local state school somewhere. So I went to see you and then he graduated the next year and credit to Troy. He really wanted to, to live that dream to either go to California or Hawaii. And he came up and said, I found the perfect school. It's got a good business program. It has a great marine biology program for me because he wanted to be a marine biologist type of guy. And so um, he said, Hawaii Pacific University. And he, he just put it out there with everything I had gone through spiritually with my own transformation, my own 180 kind of didn't really fit in with my fraternity crowd like I did in the fall semester compared to my spring semester. I felt like it was the Lord moving. And so he just kind of picked me up and put me in paradise, you know? Wow. And um, yeah. That's and awesome. so and it was a it was a trying first year. I mean, it was, it was as much fun as I had. I also got myself into quite a bit of trouble, you know, um, just when you when you party and you, you know, are <clears throat> promiscuous and there, there's consequences for living like that, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that, you know, I, I had gotten a girl pregnant my freshman year and she had an abortion. And it was through that experience that really brought me to Christ, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and so Were yeah, you against like, abortion at that time. Um, no, I wouldn't say I was until I had my, my conversion of heart. I mean, I had never been in that situation before, so I don't know what my, what my view on it really was. I just knew that it, when I, when I was in the crisis myself, my first thought was we need to get an abortion, you know, like, let's just solve this problem. Cause we weren't, I wasn't like in a longstanding relationship with a girl or anything like that. And, um, Mm. Certainly wasn't ready to be a dad. And I just turned 19 years old. So, so, so your, yeah, your, uh, your, your time in the Catholic faith that as a kid, you said you were, how did you put it? You were cat uh, culturally, culturally Catholic. Yeah. You used a different word though. You, I, and I didn't quite get it down. It was something about, it was like sacramentalized. Sabbath. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. Sacramentalized means I, I received my, you know, I was baptized as a baby. I had received my first communion around seven or eight. And then I received confirmation in high school, which is okay. when they kind of send you out and the that bishop sounds... comes and anoints you with oil. And it's really supposed to be the the being sent on mission, right? But wow. when there's no heart connection, like there is for so many Catholics that, that know things up here, I always call that the great divorce, the furthest 12 inches, right? Between your head and your heart. And there's oftentimes just not a connection made with the gospel, the basic tenets of the gospel that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, you know? Mm -hmm. like that's pretty, pretty, I mean, that's how God proves his love for us is, is at the cross that he went before our repentance so that connection happened for me as a freshman through a, an evangelical Bible study during that time in college. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. After that girl had gotten pregnant, some guys okay. reached out to me and started inviting me to Bible study. So I went cause I was in a desperate place and I went and, from scheduling the abortion to having a complete 180. Wow. Change of heart. I was as evangelicals would say born again, you know? Well, so this was not a Catholic church that did this? No, the no, Bible no, no, study? no, it wasn't. Nope. And so I, and so it was an evangelical Bible study. I went, read Romans 5, 8, was a puddle of snot and tears because I had made that connection of God's love in a very wow. personal way, 
you know, when you're at rock bottom, you know, when you, that phrase rock bottom, sometimes that's where people have to go before they can cry out to God sincerely. Mm -hmm. And so that all happened for me at a pretty young age. And as, as God would have it, as grace would have it, he picked me to Hawaii the next year, which is like the last thing I deserved, you know, because that girl ended up following through with the abortion, even though I had tried to talk her out of it um, and got my, my family involved, but that was, you know, not meant to be. So it was, it was, it was a difficult thing to accept after going through something like that to be like, and now God puts me in Hawaii in paradise because you just feel so undeserving and, un, and unworthy. I, I imagine like the prodigal son must have felt when his father throws a giant party and after he had just spent his money on hookers and riotous living, you know what I mean? I think that uh, I wanted to pr just press in a little bit more to the, the connection with abortion because you seem to have such a powerful reaction to it. And I think a lot of guys just maybe wouldn't care. So do you, what do you think happens in an abortion? What, what, how do you interpret that event? Is there, is there something tragic and horrible that happens? Of course. Yeah. It's the, it's the uh, killing of an innocent life. And you that's know? your child, yeah. right? Is that how you look at it? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So you, and you saw it that way at the time, you think? Uh, the, yeah, I think Bible so. Study? Yeah, yeah, it had, it had, there was, you know, there's a, a pretty radical change there. I mean, you go from not caring at all to now all of a sudden seeing this is your child. Yeah, and I wouldn't and have said that I didn't care story. at all. You know, I, I, I would oh, have okay. defended, I would have defended being Catholic prior to that whole experience. Oh. I had had enough of a brush with God. Like yeah. you know, as Catholics, we believe that the sacrament is, you know, right. It's a visible sign of an invisible reality, that it's actually efficacious. There's an indelible okay. mark on your soul through oh, the sacraments. Okay. And so um and so the grace of the sacrament, I believe, was still there at a soul level, but I had obviously injured that through sin, through mortal sin. And um yeah, I think it was I was in darkness, wow. you know, and the gospel and God's love intervened and broke through the darkness, mm -hmm. you know, and brought me into the light. And I could see things a lot more clearly. So as a 19 year old who had just turned 19, all I knew is that I wanted to take responsibility for my actions. And that's why wow. I tried to reason with the woman to say, no matter what happens, like, like, let's give this baby life. Because one thing I knew was that it wow. wasn't the child's fault. And I, and I've always believed that life begins at conception. I mean, I just believe, wow. you know, and that's, and that's Catholic teaching, you know? So, um, I think so, it's yeah. also common sense too, because of course, you got to yeah. start sometime and you certainly don't start at birth. Right. Um, you know, it's, I know this story actually pretty well. It's not the mm -hmm. first or second or third or fourth time I've heard it. But it's interesting to me hearing it now and just wondering how other people might hear it, just wondering what kind of questions or what kind of gaps might be there. So maybe what's interesting to people as they hear this in the future is the it might be a little puzzling how you see your story from the, the uh, powerful catholic experience growing up in terms of at least the out outward sacrament stuff which is still has a lot of grace right and i'm totally not putting it right but um then the you was it a protestant church that you were in a bible study and then the protestant kind of brought you back to seeing pro-life i mean maybe this is how people are hearing this and it might be a little puzzling how you see it is it do you and where are you coming from now? Like, how are you putting this all together now? Sure. Um, it was not a, a Protestant. Um, it was just, it was a campus ministry, you know, um, outreach. It was, okay. it was misguided in its own, in its own ways, but that's not, that's not what I'm <laughs> going into right now. But yeah, um, yeah, the intentions were good. Again, I think God can do a lot with people's desires and intentions and efforts. And they reached out. And they um, accepted me where I was. Kind of that idea of grace builds on nature. You know, it met me where I was. I was in a crisis. 
and made themselves available and shared the, shared the gospel with me, shared the scriptures with me. So when that happened that night, after reading Romans chapter five, you know, verse eight, mm. there was a spiritual renewal that happened. You know, we, I believe the Holy Spirit was, was actively, you know, present to me and working on me as a person. And did you um, believe the Bible was the word of God prior to that time? I don't know. I don't know. Probably. Okay. I probably did. Yeah. So you approached none of this was none of this was put into these categories of like, did I believe that or like pro-life? No one no one was talking about the pro-life movement. Gotcha. It was more like once you come right with God, it it informs your conscience too, you know. Yeah. Okay. I gotcha. And, and, yeah. And so it just for me, I just knew. <laughs> what was right and what was wrong, you know? And I just knew that it was selfish to end, terminate a pregnancy because of my right. age, or because of my place in life. Like every, like life comes first, you know, the life should come first and, and then work it out. And so, wow. you know, at one point the, the, the girl had actually agreed to have the baby because I was so confident. I mean, I just, no wow. one could understand, no one could understand my peace that I had in that season after I came back to the Lord in a, in a new way. I remember my college roommate who knew my whole situation. He was one of my pledge brothers and my fraternity brothers at that time. And so I confided in my fraternity brothers what had happened. And, you know, his, he was the first one to suggest, dude, you got to get an abortion. You know, I was like, yeah, absolutely. You know, that sounds and, like a fraternity thing to say, but then, but then when he saw the transformation, you know, I know that was a, had to be wild for him because he got to witness it. I mean, he saw the 180 in me and he saw my peace and he saw my decision to want to have the baby and everything. And I think it just must have been just otherworldly to him because wow. it was such a 180 change. It really was. And I had tremendous peace. I don't know. You know, that's the peace that we talk about that surpasses mm -hmm. all human understanding. Uh, it was a real, it was a reality. I was walking in it. And when I did everything I could, to, you know, and, and in retrospect, I've kind of bargained with myself where I've negotiated with myself of like, could I have done more? But I ended up basically being told by that woman that she had talked to her family about it and they had just convinced her to have the abortion. And so mm -hmm. at that point I said, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to pay for it. I'm not going to be, because I just didn't want any culpability with it. And I mm -hmm. wanted to just give her every other out, including like, you know, no financial obligations. Well, you know, which is a lot to ask, you know, she was a sophomore. I was a freshman. She actually went to CSU. I was at CU and, um, you know, and I remember receiving a letter from her after that experience. And it just, you know, I, I, there were a lot of times as anyone would look back over there, you know, when they were 19 or 20, you don't understand every, you don't remember every detail and you don't understand yourself like you do now. Yeah. So there had, there were a lot of times when I say, did I do everything I could, you know, to try to prevent that? And I probably could have done more, you know, mm -hmm. um, was I relieved that she had the abortion a little bit? You know, I, I kind of was because now I'm not 19 with a kid, you know, yeah. um, that's just me being completely honest, you right. know, but I know in my heart of hearts that had she chosen to have the child, I would have done whatever it took to take responsibility for that, which probably meant not moving to Hawaii. So this is all in a long answer to say, how did you get to Hawaii? <laughs> yeah. And so it's at some point you have to accept God's will, you know, not to say that the abortion was God's will, but God honors our free will to make choices and decisions. That was her choice and decision. And God works through everything, right? We believe that he works all things together for good. Um, and Romans eight, you know, says that. So he can take our, our choices and work with them and breathe life into them and bring good out of even, even really bad situations um, that we get ourselves into. And so, you know, in my experience, I think I was tested, you know, because he wanted to see how I would respond. And, and I, I feel like in that sense, I manned up, you know, we kind of use phrases like man up. I manned up to take responsibility, you know, it was in, in the light, told my family, told my mom, told my friends, told her, told her parents, you know, everything was there. It just, it just um, didn't happen, you know? So I had to accept that, accept forgiveness, forgive myself. And God took me to Hawaii, you know? So here I am now, 19, years old living in Hawaii and pretty on fire for my faith because of how I really felt the tangible help of God carrying me through that season, you know. Did your credits transfer? 
My like credits transferred, yes. Yeah. What were your major? What were you majoring in Boulder? Uh, business. It okay. was business. Yeah. Do you remember anything about your classes from that year? Did mm -hmm. you? Yeah, I remember yeah, my you? astronomy class and my, uh, and I remember the professor to this day, Dr. Yuri Tumri. Really? And it was one of these huge, huge classes with like 300 kids in a huge auditorium. And yeah. he was my astronomy teacher. And I just fascinated by huh. space and yeah. the universe and wow. planets. And yeah, I've always been into that. So how did that. you, how were you able to focus with all that stuff going on? I don't understand how people. <laughs> My grades weren't very school. good that first semester. That's for sure. Yeah. They were the worst I had, I had for the rest of my college experience. Um, but oh, no. okay. I always managed, you know, <laughs> you just get through it. Yeah. 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 Did the, did the fraternity stuff take a lot of time outside of class to away from your studies? Not too much. The fraternity was known you know, for guys who like to, like to win everything athletically. Okay. Um, party pretty hard with the best looking girls on campus and get great grades at the same time. And I was like, that's the so fraternity you, for me. You get someone <laughs> pregnant the, and then the morning before, and then you go study for your astronomy quiz. <laughs> Is that how that works? No. I don't know how people do this. I'm like, <laughs> but yeah, it's, well, I mean, it's a lifestyle, you know, when you're lifestyle. when you're living that party hookup we'll lifestyle. Work. Okay. You know, that yeah. was uh that was, you know, not the first time that had happened for me that semester. But and, and you're going to Bible study now at the same time. So you're going well, to... no, that, the Bible oh, okay. study didn't happen until later the desperate the desperate time started, you know. Okay, all right. So yeah, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't going to church or doing anything like that. Did you get through college in four years? I did. Wow, that's a quite quite an accomplishment. So yeah. you go from one year at Boulder, then you go to Hawaii. And yeah, you did Hawaii, Hawaii Pacific for three years. Yeah. Uh -huh. HPU, and that's where you were in 1995 when I ran into you at at Ralph Moore's Hope Chapel Kaneohe. There, meeting yeah. in some elementary school. I can't remember what it was called. Ben, ben Parker Elementary. Ben Parker. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a Friday night. I think it was probably December or November, actually. That would have been about this time of yeah. year. And I remember seeing you and just being so surprised. And... Uh, you seem like pretty active in that church. They had these things called mini church. Do you remember that? Was that mm -hmm. part of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mini church. I think that was what a midweek kind of thing. Like a small like, group. I think it was like small group communities. And yeah. 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 Do you, do you still keep in contact with anybody from Hope Chapel? Like I do. Hawaii? I do. Yeah. Um, Amanda, you know, remember Amanda Bailing? It's now, you know, Dave's sister. Yeah. I'm in touch yeah, with hung out, hung out with Amanda just about, I don't know, six weeks ago. I went back to Hawaii and oh, okay. uh, and saw her. Um, I met with Pastor Rob McWilliams, who's now the senior pastor of Hope Chapel. Um, it's now called Anchor Church. They changed the name just because there was some, a long history, you know, there was some recent drama and stuff with Ralph Moore and, and not so much Ralph, but more so his son who took over the church and I don't know. He went through a divorce and then uh, I don't know if it got a little ugly, but they just needed a refresh. And so Rob McWilliams, who I knew way back in the Hope Chapel days, um, he was, I think, like the assistant or executive pastor. Now he's the the head head pastor there. So you majored in business. And what did yeah. you end up doing uh, when when you got your business degree? What did what was your job? What, were you, what did you go into? Well, well all through college, I don't know if you remember this, but every summer I would come home and go to work at the Federal Reserve Bank down on 16th Street Mall. Yeah. Suit and tie job, carrying a briefcase. You know, it was so funny because I started that job um, the summer before my first year of college at CU. So here I was 18 with an wow. internship downtown and I just, they kept inviting me back. So for four summers, I worked there. And I would work in a different department, the cash department, the check processing department, the accounting department. Um, Jer, I remember how much you got paid for that job. You got paid $10 an hour. 
Did and I? And I remember I was like four hundred dollars a week for the summer, and I remember think doing the math on that, and you, you seem to be mostly happy with that. But that was in the nineties, right? True. Yeah, early nineties. These are four hundred dollars for nineties dollars. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. We I didn't have remember, Biden but, gas yeah. prices back then. Yeah, really. We had Clinton prices, but that, that wasn't even an issue then. So mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, I was going to graduate, and then I, accept, I had accepted a job going into my senior year after my last summer. They had made me a full-time offer. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I accepted before like I even started my senior year. And so I was going to go do that after college and work at the Federal Reserve Bank downtown Denver. And so instead, about halfway, it was probably around this time of year. It was probably like October, maybe November-ish. Um, I, I don't remember. It may have even been a little bit later. But I was surfing one day at Diamond Head with Matt Harden. And I was having a, a little kind of conversation with God out there in my own way. My own, you could just say I was praying, you know, just taking inventory, kind of reflecting. Diamond Head was kind of a special place to me. And I was trying to just kind of like have this conversation with God of, I guess I'm being directed to go, you know, graduate and then take this job. Even though I had been really influenced by guys like Ralph Moore, you know, um, I saw these guys' lives of living with an incredible amount of meaning you know, attached to their job. Um, their job was to like lead a church, you know, where they get to talk about the Bible and yeah, people's lives all day and every day and every week. I didn't know what a pastor did, but I was like, gosh, that looks pretty, pretty cool. Pretty meaningful. Yeah. And I've always been really, really heavy weight. Like, like meaning is weighted very heavily for me in my, in my world. I have to have a lot of meaning and without meaning. I start to get pretty depressed um, so the Federal Reserve didn't have meaning? Didn't have the same amount of meaning as huh. what these pastors were doing. <laughs> Why do people do the Federal Reserve job then? What do they, what I don't do know. they get out of it? They, does it not have any meaning for anybody there? I'm sure it does. It's not a judgment. It's just, you know, um, work takes up a lot of time in a person's life if you think about it. You yeah. Know, you're pretty, you know, most, most people refer to it as like their nine to five, right? Like, well, that's like 40 hours a week. Usually it's 50 or 60 with a commute, with yeah. getting dressed in the morning, with showering, right. with doing your thing, right? Like it's usually yeah. like a 60 an hour a week thing. Mm. And so I started meditating on that at, 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 you know, at Diamond Head that day surfing. And I was just kind of thinking to myself, like, I guess I'm going to go work at the Federal Reserve. I've already accepted the job. Um, was, was Matt was praying and processing this stuff? <laughs> Matt, Matt was sitting on the beach. Oh, was he? At the time. It's kind of a funny story. He was yeah. just, he had already paddled in and I was just out there He's getting some alone soul. time, I guess. What's up? And, and, and so what happened yeah. was, <laughs> yeah, what happened was, if you've seen Dead Poet Society with Robin Williams. I, I've never seen it this week, but I've okay, seen it before good. that. Yeah, I've seen good. it. Oh, yeah. There's a, there's a scene in the movie where he's talking about like law and medicine and, you know, most of the jobs that your parents would want you to go out and get, right. Cause they're high paying and they're secure jobs. And right. There's a scene where he's really ranting and he's saying law and medicine and, you know, policy or whatever. He's like, these are, these are, these are important jobs. He goes, right. Uh, love and, 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 you know, relationships. Sure. And it's good these are what we're alive for. You know, yeah, right, right. And right. that scene, and then I think he quotes one of my favorite poets, which, who is Walt Whitman. And mm -hmm. Walt Whitman says something like, the, the, the powerful play of life goes on, and you may contribute a verse. Mm -hmm. And that, in that moment, surfing in Diamond Head, that line from that poem was really like haunting me. Like, you get one verse to contribute to the play of life. What is your one verse going to be? Wow. You're going to go have a career at the Federal Reserve Bank. You're going to go be an investment banker. That was my long-term goal wow. was to be an investment banker. You know, I knew investment bankers in New York City and Solomon Brothers back in the day, and they made a ton of money. And I just was motivated by, hey, if you have a lot of money, you'll probably have a lot of freedom in life to be able to do other things. 
and I grew up fairly poor. So I just, I just always felt like money was my savior in some ways, you know, on a practical level. And the Lord just kind of let me figure it out. You know, well, you get one verse to add to the play of life. And then the, and then the question was, why don't you just invest your life into things that, that last? Like if you're a meaning guy, if that's important to you, spend your time investing in things that are going to last forever. And I was like, well, what are the three things that are going to last forever? And the only things I could think about were God's word. You know, I, I believe that God's word will last forever, mainly because his word itself says that, you know, in Isaiah, it says the, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever in Isaiah. That's always stuck with me. So I was like, the word of God is eternal. Okay. What else is eternal? Well, well, you are God. <laughs> you have no beginning and no end, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and people's souls we're immortal right we're not eternal because we have a beginning but we don't have an end yeah so we're immortal right. we will have it we will live on i believe in, in the life to come um and so the lord was like well why don't you just invest your life into those three things mm. and i'm like okay <laughs> i mean literally it was like that it was out at diamond head i made this came to this you know epiphany and uh, all of this was in, in faith. There was no mystical visions. There was no hearing audible voices. Because some people have asked me that. Did you actually hear him? And I'm like, no. It was, a, it was a call, right? In the Catholic Church, we make a really big deal out of the word vocation. You know, capital V from Latin, vocare, calling. You know? Um, and I sensed the Lord was calling me in that moment, you know? Mm. And... I paddled in and our, our friend Matt was on the beach and I said, Matt, take me home. I got to make two phone calls. I just knew exactly what I needed to do. I wow. called my mom and then I called the bank and I told my mom what I was going to do. And then I told the bank that I couldn't accept the job any longer. Thank them for being a great company to me as an intern. And uh, that I was feeling God calling me into ministry and hmm. yeah. And then, you know, here's the cool part is because I did, you know, my mom was very like, very commonsensical about the whole thing. Like you never turn down a job until you have something else lined up, <laughs> except when you're dealing with God who asked you to live by faith. <laughs> right. Wow. Right. Like Abraham, just, just go, you know, just go, just move. Right. Well, where? Don't worry about it. Just keep, just start moving. And then I'll let you know where, you know, yeah. the whole idea that God can't steer a parked car. You just got to get in motion. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I, I, I did those two things, called my mom, called the bank, you know, now I was a free man. And the very next week I walked into, at this point I had moved to New Hope with Pastor Wayne Cordero and I was just volunteering and serving. And I remember showing up early to help set up one Sunday and he called me over and he said, Hey, I've kind of been observing you, watching you, getting to know you a little bit. He said, we're starting an internship program at our church. I know you're graduating in the spring. When you graduate, I want you to come work full time for New Hope. And we'll provide you enough to live on and we'll send you to graduate school to get some Bible training under your belt. And that was the next step. So it's kind of cool to see how God, you know, I, I made the move to let go of the Federal Reserve. And then right away, he was like, here you go. Here's your next step. Wow. You know? Yeah. And so sometimes we have to let go of what we're holding on to and gripping too tight, you know, before we can receive what God has for us in that next chapter. So, so yeah, so then I, I graduated and instead of going into business, I went to go work for New Hope and mm. started graduate school at International College and graduate school right there on New Uanu, which mm -hmm. doesn't exist anymore, but it was it's cool. It's really sad. It did. It's really sad. It doesn't exist anymore. I know. I know, but it was great. So that was our church. Uh, don't, don't say my wife's name. I'm not allowed to say her name on this, but, but uh, that was our church when we got married, uh, International Baptist Church. Yep. I think actually they have the word Baptist still in the name, but they changed yeah. it on Facebook and they changed it on, they changed it on, uh, officially that they dropped the word Baptist, but yeah, upstairs they had that wonderful library. And that was the biggest theological library in the Hawaiian islands. I don't know what happened to that library. I went to a Baptist college in Hawaii too. And you know, I'm, you use that library. That was the library you could use if you wanted mm -hmm. to do some research, but well, that was that's that's a cool location too in New Orleans. Yep, that's cool. So you got your master's degree there. In yep, I was there for two years, and uh, 
got the masters and um was at the same time just just doing all kinds of menial work for the church but as i look back it was very much like my karate kid years <laughs> you know, of miyagi basically saying wax the cars and paint the fence and scrub the deck and you know wayne was saying okay you're gonna be on the setup team for church for six months i had to show up at church at like four in the morning and you know, and then six, after that, six months later, okay, now you're on the takedown team, you know, and it's just like, dude, I didn't go to college for this. And I remember one day I had a, 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 a having it out with him, you know, and I broke down in tears, actually, because I was mentally and physically drained. And it was early in the morning. And I just said, I didn't go to school for this and just feel like you're taking advantage of me. It's it's really funny because the Karate Kid analogy really works where Ralph Macho like loses it and kind of goes off on him. That's kind of uh, what I did to Wayne. Oh, you know? did he really? Yeah. And what did Wayne do? Did he go? Show me set up a chair. <laughs> right. Show! You know, and you're like, oh. <laughs> pretty much, you know, pretty much because uh, sh- shortly after that, I started a, a young adult ministry called The Bridge. Mm-hmm. And um, it was cool because it took a couple of, you know, it took a, a year of of just being selfless of service. And he would always say, like, unless you're willing to, like, serve, you have no people you have no business leading the people of God, you know, if you don't have the heart of a servant. Um, he was really big on that. He, he talked a lot about the difference between a true shepherd and a hireling and how the shepherd defends the sheep when the wolf comes, but the hireling runs away as soon as the danger comes. And so I picked up all of these great lessons, leadership lessons from King David that he would teach and, and just how, how he ministered and uh, cultivating a heart for people, you know, that if you don't have a heart for people, you really have no business being a, being a pastor or being in leadership of any kind. So it was really a servant leadership style. And um, you had to prove that, you know, with your time. And and so I did. And then I started the Young Adult Group and it really kind of took off. And it was the first platform I ever had where I was teaching on a weekly basis and, you know, trying to inspire and lead and motivate young adults in Hawaii to know their faith, to know that they're loved deeply by God, to, you know, through my own broken journey as well, up to that point of going through what I did in Boulder and, you know, looking for love in all the wrong places, you know, encouraging young people to say, don't, don't spin your wheels, look for love at the source, you know, go to Christ for that because no spouse, no job, no amount of money is ever going to fulfill you. Like God's love will fulfill you. And even then, even with, with our faith, there's going to be this very, necessary aloneness that's part of just being human you know even even my wife i'm married with kids and i love my family but i still find myself in some uncanny moments where i just feel super alone and i think i've come to accept that that's just part of what it means to be human yeah and and to and have that longing for the lord and for the kingdom and for the and for the world to come i think he wants that to exist so what what was it about well i'm what where was new hope like on the island because i yeah, know that it was on honolulu side though yeah i was in honolulu they were down by uh and then we started meeting at farrington high school um okay and they, they still meet there to, to this day oh is that in manoa or where is no that? no no it was in manoa when i first started going they actually used to meet where uh would play like basketball and stuff in that auditorium they would section off part of it okay. but now um no farrington high school is right there um I don't remember the name of the town that it's in, but it's just east of Honolulu. Kahala? No, no. Not east. that far east? Yeah. No, I'm sorry. West. West. West of Honolulu. West of Honolulu. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so what was it? Can you say really quickly, how come you stopped going to Hope Chapel and start going to New Hope? Was it just the location? Because I moved. No, I moved. Yeah, I moved to the other side of the island. So my Over I was fine doing the undergrad classes at the Hawaii Loa campus right there in Kaneohe. Oh, right, right, right. But then when I got into my business classes, all of those were in Honolulu. And then yeah. Troy had transferred from HPU to UH. I remember was, that too. He was a zoology major. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so he's in Manoa and I'm having all my classes downtown. We were having to commute over the poly to Lani Kai mm-hmm. where we were living. Yeah. So you had a nice little place in Lonnie Kai. That was Lonnie Kai is so amazing. Like I'm, I missed that, but yeah, um, totally. Yeah. And I used to work at Buzz's Steakhouse right there. And Oh and, yeah. That was a great place. I worked there. So anyway, we moved to, to Honolulu and that was partly why I, I changed churches. 
I remember being on the Zodiac with Troy and he was saying all the Latin names of all the, uh, little, uh, <laughs> all the reef fish reef stuff and <laughs> yeah, anything going on underwater. He could see it was really clear water too. It was cool. I, I have this memory yeah. of, uh, being on the Zodiac out there by the Mokes and Lonnie Kai just past those between those. And, we were out there and I don't know if you remember this, but all of a sudden a whale sprayed and, and the, it was light water and then it got dark and the water got dark and it was, it was sunny out. I don't remember that. And then it got light again. It was a whale underneath us. Wow. We were so freaked out. And I remember wanting to put my face under there and yell at them just to tell them we were here. <laughs> just to hear them crying. But yeah, they were like right, you know, right there. Yeah. I do I do remember I thought we were gonna get overturned. Yeah, yeah, I thought we amazing. were gonna get overturned. But anyway, we have some really cool memories, but we don't need to go into but so you end up going into ministry full time from from the bridge. Was that a full time job? Yeah, it was. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. How long did you do ministry for and how did you, now you're in business. So how did you, what's the link between the meaning is the theme. I think it's like you're, you want a life of meaning and you want to do things that have eternal value. Yep. And you found that in your, did you find that in your job? No. In ministry? You didn't? No. How long did it take you for you to figure that out? <laughs> How long did you do ministry before you like this? Is a while, a while. Wow. Um, like well, ten years, or what? and I'm kind How of being you? a little bit facetious, but the meaning is in the relationships, okay. and the ministry allowed me to be in a position to have some pretty amazing relationships. Gotcha. Okay. Does that make sense? Like I've told you before, and I, and I love this that you know there's only two things in life that matter relationships and i can't remember the other one so point being i find meaning in relationships you always say things like how do you stay in touch with everybody it's because i value relationships with you people. Do, yeah and, and what's what's, what's in it i have always been that way and what strikes me is um sometimes while it's true, it's also kind of like heartbreaking to me. Yeah. You know the phrase that people come into your life either for a, a, a reason, a season, or a lifetime? You ever heard that? Well, I just now did, but prior to that, I've never heard it. Okay, it well, makes it's, sense, it's, I guess. we'll meditate on it for a second, and it's, and it's true. A person will come into your life for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. And I think anyone watching or listening probably would resonate that they have, you know, on probably could count on one hand, the people that have come into their life that have been lifers that have been lifelong friends, Mm -hmm. the people that are going to be there for you when you, when you die. Mm -hmm. Um, That's what's, that's what's heartbreaking because there are going to be a lot of friends that fit into that season. They came into your life for a season. Yeah. And in some ways, it's almost, you know, to to make it even more sad is that it almost feels like a utilitarian type of relationship where it's like we use each other because we're we're both in college. We're both single. We're both bachelors. Let's run a house together. Let's have fun together. But we know this will never last. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know why. You're very sentimental, Jer. I don't know why or where it comes from, but I've just I've just valued those relationships. But I've had to accept that some of those friendships were for a season. Because when I have tried to go back into them and stretch them out or force them to be lifers, it's not been very fruitful, you know, but it's sad to me to have two people cross and keep going your separate ways. Like you're, yeah, you're, you're very, because you, love, you, love, yeah, because you love people, you know, I think of our friend Shannon Holzer. He, he's someone I think of that, you know, I really value as a person and yet we're not in close relationship. You know what I mean? Um, and that's okay because people grow. That's part of accepting it. Again, I think I think so, uh, Sh- Shannon will answer the phone if you call. Yeah, right. There's there he's, a, he's he, there's people like that 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 right. if you call them they'll answer the phone. Right. Yeah, and he's like that. You know, I I think you're kind of like channeling Aristotle, uh, Nicomachean Eth- Ethics, Book Eight, where hmm. he talks about friendship. 
And the part of that book that my students have always related to the most is that friendship part. Cause he talks wow. about this and he says, he's, you know, he's just describing there's three types of friendship. There's the friendship of utility, which is what you were talking about. There's a friendship of pleasure, which is very similar. Yeah. And those friendships are very common and they, they last as long as the utility or the pleasure lasts. And that's what college is basically is like, yeah. you know, maybe, uh, I mean, I didn't have a normal college experience. I've been a college professor, so I watch my students, but I, the closest thing I come to a normal college experience is being a professor and watching my students. Cause I didn't have that at all. I mean, right. I was in the active duty in the Navy and I, I had a very different experience, but, um, I was working all the time. And, uh, yeah. so when I see my students, like I kind of wander on the campus and I see, you know, like the billiards or whatever, they have the pool and you see the students there that are like freshmen, sophomores, you know, and they're, you can tell they have friends that just play pool together and they, they pick up pool and that's the nature of the relationship is they, they maybe study together a little bit, but they, they have a class and then that that's the end of that friendship. Right. So they, they grow out of the pool. You never see the upperclassmen playing pool like that. It's always the, it's the people that just got there, you know, and the, right. you know, that was what they were looking at. They were like, <laughs> look at that, look at that foosball table, mom, this is the place. And, um, you know, they never do that with the library. They never go to the library and go, well, look at that philosophy section, mom, this is the place. It's always, <laughs> it's always some other thing other than academics. What's the third kind of friendship that he talks about? True friendship. Hmm. And he says that is rare. Hmm. It's, it's rare because it's true. And hmm. it, it is sad, but the true friendship is takes a long time. And, uh, it, it's the kind of thing where you want the good of the other person just for right. that reason alone. You don't want anything out uh, from them. Right. You know, I mean, it's not like I'm doing you a solid. So you help me move later <laughs> or something. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and sometimes it feels like there are p business people that don't know there is such a thing as true friendship because they think entirely in terms of like utility. And I mean, and I, just, think, I think that explains the crisis uh, among yeah. men today that are completely friendless. Totally. That I mean, true. I know, I mean, I know That's people in my own family. I mean, I mean, no, you know, I love my dad. I love my stepdad. They don't have any fr male friends. Oh my gosh. Um, they have gadgets. My, 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 you know, I love my stepdad. He's got the new I I iPhone 14 and, this and that and every little thing you can think of in the kitchen appliance wise, but hmm. you know, and it just, it just, it breaks my heart because um, we were made for a relationship and, and friendship is such a gift if it's genuine and sincere. And I think a good friend really is hard to find, you know, it is. So. And, and I, and I try to live by that mantra to do unto others, be the kind of friend that you wish you had or that you need. You know what I mean? I really do try to live that, live that out as much as I can. Um, yeah. While, while having to accept the reality that we can't be that close to that many people, right. we can't love that many people that well. Right. Yeah, like, right. Uh, well, you need, well, we do need to get along yeah. in the world too. We do need right. people to help us with our business and we need people to, sure. We do want pleasure and we, you know, that, that never goes away. And uh, the pleasures change, yep. As you get older, typically, but yeah, um, yeah, exactly. So yeah, so I don't know. I mean, it's it's a bit of a mystery, but I think yeah. for me, the meaning is found in in relationships that are completely free of utility. Like I have employees and, and people that work for me, and like, right, we probably wouldn't hang out if it wasn't for work. And and it's also be, if they didn't get right. paid, they probably wouldn't show up. You right. Know what I mean? Yeah. Right. And, I, and so there's at least there's a there's a there's an understanding. Right. We, we've managed expectations, whereas friendships out of freedom. That's the blessing, because when someone chooses to show up and be present to you, you know, out of I'm, out of just out of just sheer filet yeah. of brotherly love, like that's a gift. And I, and I cherish those moments like when you and I have got to hang out and just being able to hang out like. 
It's yeah. a gift. Yeah. When, when, Cliff, when Cliff and I get to just spend time together, it's a gift. It's it's yeah. all gift, you know, because it is. Yeah. I'm there of my free will. He's there of his free will, and we're wasting the greatest asset and resource we have, which is time. We're just wasting time together, mm. you know. <laughs> I mean, maybe wasting is not the right way to put it, but we're just doing nothing. It doesn't matter what we do. Yeah. That's what that's one thing that kind of you know we're being together. We're just being together, yep. right? We're human beings. We're not human doings. And some yeah. people get into this feeling of like, I got to plan this or that or plan, make it exciting and stuff. And I, I've realized like, you don't, you know, having kids has taught me this, that it's not about going to the arcade or the cool thing or even the movies. Which, Disneyland, rock climbing. Hey, you know, it's just, skiing. it's getting lost together doing nothing. Like, you know, we, we, my kids, I take them out. We were catching crawdads in the summer in the Creek. Like I used to do when I was a kid. And that, 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 I mean, they enjoyed that more than Disneyland. I mean, we caught like 30 crawdads. I'm teaching them how, and we're barefoot in the creek, and it was free. Free. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Or we're at the golf course looking for golf balls, right? right? There's all these fun things you can do that don't cost any money. Yeah. You know, and, and I think as parents, sometimes we make the mistake of thinking, I've got to, you know, do this, 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 and this, and fly, put them on a plane and go to Disneyland and Disney World and, and and we have, by God's grace, been able to take some of those trips, but yeah, you know, don't don't let don't mistake just quality time together, you know, waste right. time together yeah. as you know as as a second you know class, uh, you know, it's not it's that's the good stuff in my opinion. So, tell us about what you're doing now. I mean, so you're not doing ministry anymore, but like, how did you go into business? And you you do seem to have. I'm going to give you a compliment here because you are the weirdest business guy I've ever met. And and I mean that as a true compliment because, <laughs> because business people, um, I, I very much appreciate that, that skill set that, that business people, and I've always felt kind of empty because I don't have it. I don't mm -hmm. have whatever that is. I feel like I'm too sentimental. I, I, I'm like you in the sense that I'm probably going to suffer a lot because I get sad. I, mm -hmm. I get sad about how temporary things are. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, if I have to move on after, you know, being in a place for a while yeah, and I'm not ready for it. Um, and then just getting older too. I mean, it, it, there's so many things that kind of suck about life, but, and I, I, I can understand why people distract themselves with pleasure and, and stuff, you know, doing stuff, the latest gadgets going on. Every time we plan a vacation, people are always say, saying, do this and do that, you know, go skiing, go rock climbing, go do whatever. And it's just like, actually, I think I just want to read a book and have a cup of coffee and watch right. the sunset. And yeah. we'll just hang out with somebody. I mean, just, yeah, you know. it's, who you're, it's who you're with, right? See, it's, yeah, not, so, it's not in vain if all of those things are with but someone you, that you value and care about, you know, you whether it's like reading, a, reading a book yeah. in Monterey and having a cup of coffee in Carmel right. totally. or, or, or going mountain biking in Aspen or something. Like if you're with the people that you, yeah, yeah. that you love and who love you like friends or, but my, or, here's my compliment. I want, I don't want to, I don't want to lose track of this compliment to you yeah. is that, is that the, you are the most meaningful business person besides maybe my grandpa that I've ever met. Hmm. And uh, you, you, in other words, I, I, when I, I know when you're doing business type stuff, you are doing it with everything you have. And I mean, I mean that like you, you were pulling your, pouring your soul into it because you think that it, it's about people ultimately. Right. Yes. So. Yeah, and what's funny is that most of my business, and this is, you know, this is where labels fall short. Because you're like, well, when when did you stop doing ministry? Yeah. When did you get into ministry? When did right, you start right. business, right? None yeah. of the labels mean shit, okay? <laughs> they don't mean shit. They really don't. I I don't see myself as a business person. You know, I just don't. And I don't see myself as a minister. If anything, I'm a minister who does business. Okay. Cause my heart is more, like you said, is people oriented. And if that means that you're like a minister to people, then, then I guess I am. But what's funny today. And one of my biggest frustrations is when I meet people like pastors and stuff, even Catholic priests that are actually business people. 
they're priests acting like business people. Right. And here I am, a business guy, apparently, who does more ministry. Yeah. And it's like our roles were reversed. I'm like, if you're going to be a priest, be a priest. Don't, you know, I'm not going to, It's a, that's a whole other, that's probably my Are you more. talking about like the priests that run like a campus, like a, like, because we, when I first got there's to Loyola, just, America, there's just right like, now, uh, there's something church. like a, a new springtime going on in the Catholic Church of entrepreneurial ventures. Um, you know, really? we call we call them apostolates, okay, They're like an apostle ship, but we call them apostolates, and it's not a bad thing. But, but um, I just kind of feel like it would be great if people could just stay in their lane and do do their do what they were signed up to do. And maybe I'm wrong in that, but like, I expect a priest to be a great priest. You know, you know, you know, celebrate a, a beautiful, faithful liturgy. You know you know, make yourself available for, as a Catholic, right? And so we never got into that part of the story, how, how I'm Catholic, but, you know, make yourself available for confession, celebrate, you know, the celebration of the Eucharist, um, evangelize, set your, your laity up for success by helping them discover their gifts and talents and passions so that they can share in the work of the ministry with you. But don't start, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I just kind of feel like we, we've got all these ventures going on being led by these Catholic priests. And I just kind of, it kind of throws me a little bit, you know, Hmm. maybe it shouldn't, but it just, it just kind of bothers me mainly because we just need really good, holy, good priests, you know, and um, not to say that they're not the business guys aren't, it's just that we're so lacking that we need, we need more of those. So if you're a priest, then you can't be a minister who does business. I don't know. Maybe you can. That's, That's what I'm saying. Like, maybe I'm wrong. I probably am wrong, but okay. I just kind of feel like there's sometimes more energy put into trying to do everything, you know, like, like a business um, leadership courses and classes and, you know, it just almost sound like business people more so right. than, priests, you know, I guess I was puzzled because you just said that the labels don't mean beep. they don't, they don't, but, but the label of a priest really does matter. <laughs> Oh, I mean, okay. I that it. really matters to me anyway. So that uh, sounds like a very Catholic thing to say. Very, so, well, yeah. Well, as Protestants, you don't have priests. Right. So. Well, priesthood of all believers is what people say. Yeah. Um, and so everybody's a priest. Um, and uh, now uh, being a yeah. priest. We, for we, a don't need to go down, we don't need to go down that rabbit hole. When, when Paul talks about like, bishops and deacons and structure in the church i mean that existed since the first century right you know there's a lot more to it so uh if you want since you brought up labels i mean we can talk about that if you want why is the label of a priest so big such a big deal for catholics because of the sacramental life of the church Mm -hmm. um you know, one of the one of the earliest writings, St. Ignatius of Antioch uh, wrote some letters to the same churches that Paul had started. It's called the Didache writings. It's, right. written, it's included in the Didache. So St. Ignatius was was martyred in Rome. He was fed to wild beasts. Anyway, it's, it's amazing to think about that he wrote letters to some of the same churches that St. Paul had started, which yeah. is just kind of cool to, to, to know that they, they lived on a little bit. Mm. But... Um, it's the first, it's in his writings that that we ever see the word Catholic, um, right. meaning lowercase c, meaning universal, right? Part right. of the whole. That's what it means to be Catholic is to be a part of the whole, to be universal, um, not to be confused with universalist. <laughs> um, and it's also where we see the word Eucharist, um, and he talks about you know the authority of the bishop as well and that and that you can't do anything without the authority of of the local bishop um right so there's a lot there but you know he says where the eucharist is there is the catholic church you know and meaning the sacrament of the eucharist that christ instituted at the last supper you know um commanding us do this in memory of me right uh not in a hero worship kind of a way but in but in um participating in that you know this is my body this is my blood so to answer your question like a lay person like myself cannot consecrate the eucharist 
I cannot take the bread and wine and consecrate it where transubstantiation would happen, where it becomes the literal body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus. That's what we as Catholics believe by faith. It's a mystery, you know, to be embraced, not to be conquered. And so, um, you know, and, and we believe that because that's what the church has always taught, you know, from the very writings of scripture in John chapter six, you know, I think, I think it's kind of ironic. St. Jerome was the one who put chapters and verses in the Bible, which was much later, right? So when we originally had the Bible, you know, the, the letters of the New Testament in Greek, it wasn't chapters and verses, but ironically, John chapter six, verse 66, so the, the 666, which we connote as the mark of the beast, um, which was like the amount of money that remember was countered up when David called for that. Um, John 666 says that many of his disciples left him because it was a hard teaching. And the teaching was, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And so he wasn't speaking symbolically as so many people have said or think that he said, because he wouldn't leave if he was teaching symbolically. And then he turns to Peter and the apostles and he says, are you going to go away too? And they said, to whom shall we go, Lord? You alone have the words of eternal life. And so, you know, we, we believe that when Jesus, you know, at the Last Supper said, this is my body, we believe it is. And that happens through the hands of the priest. And that's exactly why the apostolic authority is so important. And that's why when men are ordained, right, the priest, the, the bishop will lay hands on the men and say a prayer, passing that on, that authority on to them, just like Timothy was, you know, St. Paul did that to Timothy. And he writes about that in the New Testament through the laying on of hands, he says. Mm. And so, um, and so that's very important. You know, that, that's what it means to be Catholic. It's what the church has always taught. And so gotcha. it wasn't, it wasn't until about 500 years ago that someone said it was just a symbol. Gotcha. So, yeah. What, what about, uh, do you say Catholicism? What, mm -hmm. what about it draws, draws you to it? Is it just, just is it the officialness of it, of it all? No, no, like it's that, it's or? it's the it's the truth of it and the meaning. Um, you know, Jesus Jesus says, "Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it." And if you look at the history of the Catholic Church, it's kind of had this amazing like rise and fall through the ages. Where you know, you look at like the French Revolution, right, where they literally killed every every Catholic priest and bishop they could find. Like at one point they were kind of like, I think we killed the church. Like, mm. you know, and, uh, and then all of a sudden it's like a beach ball that you try to hold into the water in the swimming pool. It just pops up over here. And then you push it down and it pops up over here. And yeah. I think it's the church that Jesus started. That's why okay. it's so meaningful to me. Okay. I really believe that. Yeah. And then if you go to Rome, you'll see in St. Peter's Basilica, um, the name of every, pastor every head pastor the pope every pope since since peter through every every generation that we've ever had that, that you know apostolic tradition um or apostolic succession i should say and it's cool because like you'll see clement in there and clement's one of the guys in the bible that saint paul talks about and uh he became the leader of the church you know um after peter was crucified upside down in rome and so, wow. so there's just so much history to it you know there's mystery you know gk chesterton who's someone i respect a lot intellectually incredible author you know you know gk chesterton he was uh, 52 when, but... i know but he was 52 years old when he converted to catholicism and someone asked him like why now why would you convert to catholicism and he, and he said it was the last community of faith he found that was willing to embrace mystery Mm -hmm. rather than try and conquer mystery mm. and i do feel like in evangelical you know products of the enlightenment it's this it's this attempt to try to mm -hmm. systematize everything and make everything understandable and then categorize everything and we're talking about god here you know and i love how every mass the priest after the consecration he actually holds up the eucharist and he says behold the mystery of faith you kind of say like i, I don't fully comprehend it i don't understand it like the trinity right i mean that's probably a better bridge to build on because evangelical christians believe in the trinity even though it's a catholic doctrine that was given to them you know uh, kind of like the bible was was given to them but um if they believe in it even though it's not in the bible 
specifically, right? You're not going to see the word Trinity in the Bible, but right. we believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, which is a mystery that we can comprehend, that we can apprehend, but we can't comprehend, right? So there's a lot there, Luke, in terms of in terms of why I value it, you know. Um we could talk forever about that, but you know, one one quote that's kind of was challenging to me as an evangelical was from Cardinal John Henry Newman, who was an Anglican bishop in England who became Catholic, and he said, "To be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant." You know, and of course, he's the one who wrote, I think, the idea of a university um, and colleges and all of that. That was a whole product of you know. That's why we have Newman centers. That's Cardinal John Henry Newman. Um, yeah, but to be that that line to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant it really struck me, and as someone really sincerely seeking the truth, like ask and keep asking, knock and keep knocking, I kept following the speaker wire back, and while it went to the Reformation, I kept going, and the church got less splintered and fragmented, and started to see that oneness, you know, and then you've got the the schism in a thousand with the Eastern, you know. Um, orthodox church and, and roman catholicism but if you keep going back it's 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 one church which ironically is what jesus prayed for in john 17 that we would all be one you know in his high priestly prayer i mean that's and so i say to people sometimes i say wouldn't it be cool if just for once we could answer one of jesus's prayers because he's answered so many of ours wouldn't it be cool if we as a church could come together and fall on our swords a little bit and fold up our tents and be one church yeah you know, because if you were dropped in the first or second century and said, where's the church? One thing you would have never heard was which one. <laughs> well, you, I just want to go back to something you said, because it's 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 just it's something I want to press into a little bit um, and we can talk about your yeah, business. Yeah, right? yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I was I've been hanging on for a few several minutes now wondering about this and. I said, well, what was it about Catholicism that presses you in? And, and, and I said, is it the officialness of it? And he said, no, it's truth and meaning. But then it seemed like the history part, which is so meaningful, mm -hmm. just feels like it's a, it makes it official for you and for Catholics. I think when, when you said, is it the officialness of it? Like, did you mean like, like it's, it's, you know, Jesus started this. It's kind of like a, a franchise, like this McDonald's goes all the way back to the McDonald's brothers. This is the official one. And so this is, you know, you can trace the history of it. And this is like the legitimate McDonald's oh, versus yeah. all the other fake McDonald's or the other hamburger places or whatever. I don't know, but probably a bad analogy, but. It, no, it, it's, it's the, the reason why it's, the, the reason why it's a challenging conversation is because there are millions of people who hate what they think the, the Catholic church is. Oh, okay. So the, 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 the whole, the whole understanding of, of people's perception or misperceptions, right? Yeah. yeah, totally. I thought that Catholics worship Mary. I thought they prayed to dead people. I thought that they, I thought the rosary. Talk, talk about that. Talk about. I thought the answer. rosary was about Mary and not about Jesus, you know. And it's, it was, in fact, it completely revolves around the whole life of Jesus, you know, mm -hmm. through the mysteries. It's Jesus's life. Um, oh, so, okay. So, I so, gotcha. so there were just so many misperceptions that I had about what the Catholic Church taught, and by God's oh, grace, right. I had the opportunity to to to, to be, really be kind of mentored or discipled or taken through what the Catholic church actually teaches by Archbishop Charles Chaput, who is the Archbishop of Denver in 2005 is when I got to, got to do that. I met him. I was a pastor at the time when I met him here at Pathways in Denver. And, you know, he met me at Starbucks for three hours. And the well, first wait, thing he hold said, on. this is the Archbishop that met you for three hours. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that kind yeah. of a high post? Very high post. Yeah. Wow. And uh, but he was he's always been just he knows his his role. He you know is what to was evangel. his name again? What was his name? Charles J. Chaput, C H A P U T. Looks like Chaput. Is he legit? Super legit. Oh my gosh. Yeah, he, he got transferred to Philly and uh, now he just recently retired. Oh. And we were all kind of, we were all kind of bummed that he wasn't made a cardinal because he's just such a faithful, dynamic bishop. Wow. 
So he met me at Starbucks for three hours. But what he said was, he said, Jeremy, I just want to lay out, I don't know what your perceptions are or what your issues with the Catholic Church are. Because he said, I knew you were raised Catholic. You know, you were sacramentalized. Um, obviously, something didn't connect. There was a drift. Mm -hmm. goes, so I don't know what you think. But he said, if you're open to it, I'd like to lay out for you what the Catholic Church actually teaches. And I'd like to ask you for forgiveness for how we failed you in practice. Wow. The Archbishop said that. Yeah. Of Denver. Yes. E does each city have an Archbishop? They have a Bishop. Oh, archbishop bishop. is depending on size. So if it's a lot, if it's a big area with a lot of different parishes, I think it's an archdiocese. If it's a oh. smaller area, it's just a diocese. So oh, okay. um, that's, that's just kind of the organizational structure. But so he showed a lot of a lot of humility in saying that, but he also was able to help me separate what church teaching from sinful practice that's existed since the time of Peter. Right. And oftentimes we as humans, of course, just, you know, Shane Claiborne has a great line when he goes, oh, I'm not into it. Like church is full of hypocrites. And Shane Claiborne will say, we always have room for one more. You know? <laughs> it's not completely full, you know, meaning, meaning that since the time of Peter, we've had human fingerprints all over this deposit of truth that we received. And so, you know, I joke with people and say, if you ever find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll ruin it. Right. Right. Because we're obviously it's a joke, but we're obviously all filled with problems and sin and issues. Yeah. And so thankfully, Jesus came for people with issues, you know. Right. Uh, and I always tell people, if you don't know what your issues are, that's your issue. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, so so he he was able to separate church teaching from sinful practice hmm. and were you, never, a, were you a protestant during this conversation or were you uh, even even evangelical, back? evangelical. Oh, i've never been considered like consider myself like a reformed protestant you know oh, okay gotcha. you know we use that word to say non-catholic I, I was evangelical you know um it's probably the best way to say it now i just say i'm evangelically catholic you know i'm still an evangelist i still share yeah. my faith a lot i still think the world needs to hear the gospel it's just right. It's just that Jesus had a church too. And I feel like we've kind of severed the head from the body in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. And that's why it's so splintered and all over the place. And there's been never been more division in the church than there is right now in 2022 um, in history. Uh, over 4,000 denominations right now in, in the, the Christian church, um, which is heartbreaking when, when our Lord in John 17 prayed that we would be one, right? So do you feel like people take those denominations seriously anymore though? Because not it really. Seems, it seems like people they're all are splintering, dropping, right? They're yeah, dropping. they're splintering, right? You Presbyterians have split. Whenever then, I see people drop the word Baptist, I, just to say community church, I was like, I don't know. It just bo it's kind of bothers me. I mean, yeah. it just, it feels like uh, it's good to have an honesty about where you're coming from. Like if you, Sure. Like martial arts and you're doing Taekwondo, but you don't want to call it Taekwondo. You call it just martial arts. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, like, kind of like different know. tribes is how I would refer yeah. to it. You know? Yeah. I'm fascinated with native America, first nations. You know, I love studying the history of, you know, red cloud and sitting bull and the Lakota and the Cheyenne and right. And it's amazing, like these tribes, but it really is like, they actually had different dialects, spoke different, different languages. Um, and, and I think it's a matter of each other. I think it's <laughs> that too. I think it's a matter of language, right? Like so many evangelicals and Catholics want the same thing. They just use different language to get there. Right. They really do. I mean, we, we are so much more united than we realize than divided, yeah. honestly. I mean, it's usually comes down to a handful of a barrier of entry for right. Catholics and evangelicals. Like yeah, yeah. we'd have to talk about the Pope. We'd have to talk about Mary's role. We'd have to talk about the sacraments. We'd have to talk about infant baptism, maybe a few other things that are like big, hot, hot issues for people. But I think a lot of the Trinity, right? The, the, the whenever, gospel I, message. whenever I hear people, if, if I hear somebody that says they're converting Catholicism and they're going to church, I get excited. And you know why? It's because I know that otherwise they would just know in nothing. They would know nothing mm -hmm. about the Bible. They would know nothing about church history. Right. Um, so I, I get excited from it at just because it as an educator, I get excited. Maybe they'll even learn Latin. I mean, I still haven't learned Latin, but I, I want to. 
Right. And, you know, they'll learn some theology. I think we have such a biblically illiterate and just historically illiterate society that right. the church is one of those things that helps bring people in touch with the past and yeah. show them meaning. And, well, I, and I think, yeah, and I think everything rises and falls on leadership. Okay. And this is a bigger issue. Like, like the structure of the Catholic church, part of the genius and part of the, like the tragedy is that it's a parish based model meaning every neighborhood or neighborhoods have a parish within its boundary. That boundary, that parish has everything they need to live out the, the teachings of the church. They have the daily mass. They have the sacrament of the Eucharist. They have confessions. They have a place to gather for praise and worship and hear, hearing the word of God. They have everything they need in a parish boundary. And there are parishes everywhere throughout the country, 17,000 of them. And like, you know, like you're in San Francisco, right? Like the Franciscans named that city after St. Francis of Assisi, right? Like there's Catholicism, marks of it everywhere. <laughs> but I also say it's kind of the tragedy because oftentimes as goes the parish pastor, there goes the parish. Is he dynamic? Is he good? Does he love the Lord? Does he love the word of God? Can he preach? Can he teach? Can he mentor? Can he raise up and identify leaders in his congregation, mm -hmm. Right. Can he raise money? Can he right? all of those things are important as a pastor? Wow. But the reality is, is we don't always have we don't we don't have like rock star pastors in every parish. So it's you not know? automatic. It's not like just because he's Catholic. And, and, and so when it comes says, to you and saying, Hey, what was your Catholic church experience like, Luke? If you just randomly decide to walk into St. Gabriel's or you know, whatever parish, St. Mary's down the street, and you walk in and you're like, I'm gonna check out what Jared's talking about here, and you just sit in the back. Let's say you didn't even participate in the mass. You just watched. I don't know how that's going to go for you. I don't know what it's going to, if, you're, if there's going to be like radical hospitality saying, oh, great to meet you, Luke. Welcome. You know, um, that's my hope, right? Is that it would be this amazing experience for everybody. <laughs> and that's the challenge of, of doing ministry well. And it's difficult when your church is so big and so old, right? Yeah. I mean, the Catholic community is, is the oldest church, the biggest church in the world. Uh, and so it's an easy target. You know, we got pedophile priests, we got men falling into sexual sin as leaders. We have, which, which happens in every faith community, but why is the spotlight always shine on the Catholic church? You know, cause it, it, I don't know, but it's the biggest church. So it's an easy target. So you're going to find a lot more sin in it. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a labor of love, you know, but for me, again, I come back to Jesus saying, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so I think at the end of the day, when everyone else has splintered and folded and been woke, woken and, you know, <laughs> and marrying gay couples and stuff like that, like that's, you know, it's just, it's moved so far from even just what the scriptures teach, you know, um, at some, at the end of the day, who says, even the, homo, those, uh, even the homosexuals can't keep up with it because as soon as they, they, uh, they get one of the goals, then it's all of a sudden the 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 goal line change, and it's like, oh no, we don't know what a man is anymore. Right. Yeah. I don't know how you, uh, how, how can you be homosexual, which means same sex, if you don't know what what the what the man is. What, right. what is that? How can you be attracted to the same? gender so so, so we've, we've never we, we've never needed like a clarion like clear call like authority more than right now you know and and unfortunately like as a catholic like i love i love pope francis as a person but he he's a loose cannon as a as a universal pastor of the catholic church because you never know what he's going to say and he's argentinian he's from argentina the, the culture is different there the way he says things off the cuff are taken out of context sometimes. But my point is, is that we need, you know, we have the authority. I don't, I don't know if it's being exercised as well as it could be, but people, people are looking, I believe are looking for, for that because at the end of the day, who has the final say, you know, can you, can you marry gay couples or can't you, can you do this or that? Right. Can you, you know, I think, I think that's a question of authority. Are there homosexual so, couples that want to that, get on that sense? The Catholic, Catholic Church's Catholic Church? the Catholic Church's teaching hasn't changed. What's that? 
I was just wondering, are there same sex couples that want to get married to each other in the Catholic church? I, I know that they so. can go down. I mean, I'm the sure, street. I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are, but that, that that's not happening because, okay. because, because that's not what the church teaches and everybody knows that, and you know, in, in the Catholic community. Mm-hmm. So there are, there are quote unquote Catholics, you know, that like Nancy Pelosi, or you know, they're they're, they're Catholic in name, that if you know, um, but in my opinion, you know, they don't they're not standing with the church in matters of faith and morals. So, you know, Joe Biden is a Catholic, okay, but yeah. he doesn't stand in union with the church that he says he's a part of. Right. He doesn't. He's he's not standing, you know, in unity with the church when it comes to abortion. When it comes to, to gay marriage, when it comes to these things, and, and he'll say personally, I'm pro-life, but publicly I'm right. And it's just, yeah. it's just such, you know, it's, it's yeah. duplicity. Hmm. I've never heard of those, those politicians. Are they politicians you just mentioned? Mm-hmm. I'll look them up. Right. And that's why Archbishop Corleone in San Francisco actually refuses to give Nancy Pelosi communion. And he's instructed all the parishes in San Francisco that if Nancy Pelosi attends your mass to come up for communion, that you're to deny her communion because she's out of line publicly as a leader, out of line with the teaching of the Catholic faith, who's professing to be Catholic. So I don't mean to sound so old hat, but there is such a thing (laughs) as orthodoxy, you know, and um, it's it's really, truly, in my opinion, is is a scandal to say that you are Catholic. I don't and know that, why she would want to get communion if she doesn't believe the faith. I don't know. Right. Why exactly. would she want to show up and, and get some kind of, what does she believe that there's going to be some benefit or is it just a habit? It's probably a, you know, like, like anyone who's like traditionally like, Hey, we're Italian we're Catholic. It's what we do. It's our family. Right. There's yeah. some pretty deep That's ties there. There's some very deep, long-standing ties totally. to the church. Yeah, but in terms of just you know, there's zero integrity in it if you mm. if you say you believe that you're a Catholic but you don't believe what the church actually teaches. That just is a you it's know, a little it's a little weird. Yeah, that's very weird. You know, so we have a lot of problems. You know, in, in our yeah. church, a lot, a lot of sin to repent from. But again, I'll say it. You know, till my dying day, that the deposit of faith that was handed down to us from Christ and the apostles has been protected and guided by the Holy spirit. And I believe at the end of the day, will probably be the last, last church standing. That's just my personal belief. So. So do you want to talk about your business? Sure, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, what do you it's do for a, a living? <laughs> I run a, a, a little, little J marketing. Um, it's an agency brand agency focused on, um, you know, Brand building on what's, creative, what's, creative and marketing. What's the story behind the name, Little J? Well, um, when I started it ten years ago, tomorrow will be t- ten years. Wow! Yeah, congratulations, and, man! And your anniversary. Yeah, tomorrow, November twelfth, wow. two thousand twelve, is when I incorporated it. Um, wow. Little J. How do I how do I go about this? So when I when I was starting the business, I was actually going to start it with with a friend whose name started with J also. So that's where the J came from. Um, and we thought like Jesus is like the big J, and we're the little J. Yeah. You know? Okay. And uh, gotcha, gotcha. It, and it was an appeal. It was an appeal towards a dialogue, like conversation, like little J. Our typeface is all lowercase not like big caps trying to shout at you. Cause I feel like in marketing and messaging, everyone's already getting hit and, and, and shouted at all the time. So yeah. I wanted a brand that would try to start a conversation and, and create a dialogue with people, you know, again, being people based relationship based, um, how can we help you market yourself and have conversations with people rather than like shout at people. Mm. So um, that's part of the little J for me. It also kind of rhymes with the little way, which is something from St. Therese of Lisieux, France. She's one of the, um, anyway, she's an amazing person and, and she's, she's a saint in the church. Um, She had this thing called the little way. So the little J always reminds me of that. 
and um, the domain was available. So there's not a lot of domains available these days to get what you want. So, so um, who's selling these domains? People who who bought them a long time ago. They're called domain squatters. They'll they'll just go up and buy domains. You can go to any, you know, like a GoDaddy or a, you know, and buy the domain. Like. Oh. The web was just taken off. People started buying up domains. And then those okay. companies that they actually, like if you bought unitedairlines.com before United Airlines bought the domain, they would have to negotiate a deal to buy that domain from you. Gotcha. Can you, can you imagine? How do you, how do you find out who owns it and how do you get the, how do you? You can go online. I mean, a lot of times it's it's confidential or, or protected, but sometimes you can go on who is, you know, who is.com and, um, search to see who owns certain domains. Mm. Yeah. I think we have to renew our domain soon here. So I'm not sure how to do that. I'm hoping it just automatically. You, you renews. just go back to the company that you bought it from. And you probably have a login and a, and a, and a password for that company like GoDaddy or, or Namecheap or Bluehost or any, any of these companies that sell domains. Okay. And then you, you contact them. Like I could find out who, who your registrar is, your domain registrar. And then you just contact them. And if you don't have the username and password, you say, I forgot it or I lost it. And they'll help you reset it. That you happens verify, a lot. Verify your identity and then say, I want to make sure that I'm up for renewal or auto renewal. How much does it cost? And if it's, if, if it's more than like 20, 15 to $20 a year, then switch your domain. You can transfer your domain to a different registrar because you actually own that if you're paying for it. Hmm. Yeah, it's like digital real estate. You own that little postage stamp, like republicanprofessor.com. Yeah. You know? Okay. And, and, and you don't, you're not always stuck with that domain registrar. If they're going to try to up the price on you and you can get it for, you know, less, you can, you can transfer it. Gotcha. Usually not too expensive though for a domain. You should probably just buy it for like five years because if you do it for longer, the price comes down even more. It's a bit of a volume discount. Mm -hmm. so if you say five okay, we'll, years, we'll talk yeah. about that we'll talk yeah. about that make sure we're squared away i think it was in february that we we got it so i'll I'll, t I'll take a look see what we got there um make sure we're squared away on that so you how did you get it how did you figure out you don't seem like a a web guy like i don't i never pe pegged you as like a computer guy yeah i'm not a web guy so, so there's a difference between it and marketing right yeah there's certainly overlap if you're going to be like a digital marketing agency. I don't, I don't, we're not branded as a digital marketing agency. We're just an agency that does okay. digital marketing and traditional marketing. So we do a lot of like press releases and we can do radio spots. We do video production. We do print collateral, right? But a lot of the lion's share of our work is digital because that's just how people work today. Um, social media. This is what I mean by digital marketing, social media, email marketing, right? Designing and, and building emails and sending them out to people's lists, creating web pages, landing pages for campaigns, you know? Um, yeah. So it's, it's really marketing com and communications, you know? And a big part of that is, is strategy. You know, it's not always just tactical execution of creative work and, and then casting that out. It's talking at a higher level of like, what's your brand strategy? How are we going to build brand equity for you? You know, what is your promise as a company? Uh, what are you promising your, your prospects and your customers? And are you delivering against that promise? Because that's how you build brand equity over time, you know? Um, so it's a, it's a whole, I mean, you could get a master's degree in this stuff. You know, there's a, there's a lot of classes out there on how to build brand equity. What is a brand, you know? Um, and so strategy is super important. And we usually start with our, with our clients with strategy which might look like a couple of days together, two or three days uh, with key stakeholders in the organization talking about the big important questions, you know, what do you, what are you offering? How is it different? Why does it matter? You know, yeah. let's look at your messaging. What messages are you, are you sending out? What are your benefits? Not just your features, but how are people going to benefit from your product or service and helping them craft those messages succinctly, you know, wordsmith that, and then, and then showcase it and feature it on a beautifully designed website. You know, a lot of companies that started in, in the eighties or nineties and they're, they're due for like rebranding. You've heard that word, right? Like, yeah. like 
the brand has grown tired. It needs a refresh, you mm-hmm. know? Um, but how do you, how do you become a target rather than a Kmart, right? Remember Kmart's? Yeah. It's the difference between having a charismatic brand or a static brand. You know, Coca-Cola would be a, a charismatic brand. Shasta Cola was a static brand, right? Um, charismatic brands are like Disney and Apple and McDonald's and Sony and Nike and right. Um, they all have an equivalent static brand that you could list over here. And K- so, what, what was, what was static about Kmart? Um, that's a good question, but <laughs> target target did something with their brand, you know, even, even in their logo, you know, the red target, the color palette. Okay. Um, like, I feel like they've, they've entrenched themselves in my hearts in my wife's heart and mind because mm-hmm. she loves target, you know? And, and so it's all about how do you go about building, building your brand. And, and a big yeah. part of that is consistency, consistency, consistently delivering right against your brand promise. Gotcha. So take Starbucks, for example, every Starbucks you walk into, you're going to have a very similar experience. You'll hear the coffee grinders. You'll smell the coffee. That's all by design. The same kind of couches, the same kind of, you know, look and feel, you'll hear music. Right. We'll be wearing red aprons this Christmas at everyone, you know, yeah. green throughout the year. And they actually call it Christmas. Unlike Pete's coffee, they call it a holiday. Yep. They all call it holiday blend. That's what and I like about Starbucks is they call it a Christmas blend. Nice. Even though they have a total pagan symbol. They, right. At least they which have the com- holiday. Which right. comes from Christ's mass. <laughs> right. Not the symbol, but the name. I know. I know. But yeah. again, back to the root meaning, right? Right. Totally. Talking about mass. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Although I think Pete's has better coffee. Yes, I agree. We have one one Pete's close by here, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's that it's that idea of consistently delivering. That's how you that's how you gain traction, right? You you continue to deliver the same experience, and that's what McDonald's has done so well with their franchises. I mean, uh, 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 I, I'm a, I'm a sucker for number nine two cheeseburger meal. I love the two cheeseburger meal. I don't have McDonald's a lot, but when I do, I'm going to get a number nine. And they even took it off the value menu and I'll pull up and say, do you have the two cheeseburger meal? And they're like, yeah, we can do that. (laughs) So, so, you know, it's the same everywhere you go. Um, Pretty much tastes the same. Chick-fil-A, you could probably say the same thing about, you know. Um, But I mean, I could say the same thing about Kmart. Like, I don't. I I've never gone into a Kmart and go, what, where the hell am I? <laughs> like they all look the same, but well, they don't exist anymore. First of all. Yeah. They're out of business. Same with Sears. So you just so, have to wait for them to go out of business to know if they're static or not. No, no. You just look at the, you look at By the, the way. Sears uh, still exists. There's still it's all Sears. The, it's There's true. a Sears and Whittier. It's all of the, um, well, it's, it's the shareholder value and the stock price too. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, yeah. You know, how do you measure brand brand equity, brand value? It comes down to money. You know, okay. Kmart ran out of money. They didn't have enough customers. Why did Why did Target win over that market share? You know, what well, What did they do differently than Kmart did? And if you dig deep enough, you'll see it was in the marketing, it was in the messaging, it was in the experience, it was in the way that they branded themselves, um, it was in their ads and commercials. So, you know, I think Kmart played it safe and lost. And Target took risks and won. They took risks with with who they who they partnered with. You remember when we were younger, like brands like Massimo, Beachwear, and stuff. They would partner with Massimo, and they would have cool cool clothes in the Target now. Ah, uh, see, and they wouldn't do that at Kmart. Okay, uh, and so and so they had a lot of that kind of you know consumer research done and, and insights that I think set them apart from from one oh, another. Oh, okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, but in business, there's clearly winners and losers, right? I mean, and that's usually rewarded on earnings days of how yeah. they performed and how they're forecasting for the next quarter, right? That's what's so funny about about these things is that almost doesn't matter how, as long as you didn't disappoint on your, you know, your top line revenue and your earnings per share. Like as long as you didn't disappoint in the current quarter, what really matters is what you're doing in the next quarter, because you could you could knock it out of the park for the past quarter. And forecast a little lower than the analysts were expecting, and your stock will get crushed. Right? Wow, that's what's going on. That goes on every day. But if you crush for a, pub, for a publicly you traded, it, yeah, for a publicly traded company. But what about like private company, like you know, pri- closely held? 
private company. That's a whole nother, yeah, that's a whole nother ball of wax. Sounds like a lot of this is just intuitive and like a gifting you're born with. Like, can you be trained in this or is this like, did you just. Oh yeah. You can completely be, you can completely be trained in it. I was trained in it. I was mentoring it, even though I studied it in college, that just kind of, as you know, an undergrad degree, it just kind of gets your feet wet a little bit. Yeah. It's not real world experience. No, I, I didn't really learn anything about marketing and communications until I was, I was working at Focus, which is the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. And they had put me in like a public relations role because they thought I would be good, like a good face for the organization, you know, um, having been evangelical and then, and then knowing why I was Catholic now. And then there's this young ministry that's very much like Campus Crusade for Christ, but it's yeah. Catholic, right? It's evangelically Catholic. So it's not just the gospel. It's just the gospel and the church. Um and so I felt, you know, drawn to it as soon as I came back into the Catholic Church in 2006. So that was 17 years ago. And there was a mentor I had there named Mark Collar. And Mark had just retired from Procter & Gamble, I think at like 51. They have a good retirement program. He's very, that. very, very uh, talented and gifted man and was real successful at P&G. He's lived in Cincinnati where they're headquartered. And he started coming to Denver and coming out to, to the Focus headquarters. And then I met him and we kind of hit it off. And he said, hey, I want to just take you under my wing and teach you everything I know about, about brand and brand building and marketing. And I said, yeah, I'd love to learn. So I got, you know, a great, uh, I had a great mentor in him, a lot of hands-on training, um, hired a great team, had some really talented people that I learned from, designers and different things like that, you know. Um, and so you go down, it, it was something that was totally learned, you know, it was kind of like me finding my lane since I couldn't be in ministry as a pastor anymore, being a Catholic and not feeling called to the priesthood. I started to find my lane in marketing and communications. And so I, you know, I had some success there, um, branded a couple of cool things. You know, one is, one is called seek. It's a conference for college students. And I came up with the name, it's called Seek. And now there's like 20,000 or more college students attending that from around the country, from Harvard to Cal Berkeley. And uh, Focus has a presence at Cal Berkeley, believe it or not. Um, everywhere needs Christ. They need to see the faith lived out. And these missionaries live it out. Wow. They live it out every day on campuses. I think they're on like 150 campuses now, maybe 160. They have, they have like 800 or 900 missionaries full time. Catholic missionaries, all in their twenties, um, and this was something I yeah. got to be a part of and kind of get going. You know, it, it existed. It, don't get me wrong; I wasn't one of the founders, but right. I think there were like thirty or forty campuses when I joined, and now there's one hundred and sixty. To what extent does the marketing is, is that that's what takes credit for getting people in the door, and not the spirituality? I would say not very much i would say the credit I, I, for the seat conference maybe like the conference which is one of the huge feeders for people that are yeah. like new to focus or want to know what it's about they'll come to a conference and it's really no different than a huge evangelical i mean we've got matt marr on stage we've had third day come and play on stage we've great speakers you know breakout sessions you know it's just really it's a time to come and see how many people are trying to live their faith that you're not okay. a lone ranger because there's a lot of solid catholics out there Mm -hmm. um, that feel like they're a lone ranger on their campus. Like, gosh, yeah. my mom, I'm really trying to follow the Lord and right, right. do the right thing and not just sleep around and party. And, yeah. and so, and so focus is, you know, and, and the seat conference especially brings together when you're bringing like 20, 25,000 college students from across the country, wow. it's a huge shot in the arm to be like, look at all these people praising God. I'm not alone, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. And so, so that was one of my, I would say one of like my big wins and then a big strategic move for focus. Um, it used to be called the focus national conference. And then I came up with seek and branded at that. And the, and the tagline was what moves you. It's not a question. It was supposed to be seek what moves you. And it was really an appeal to people's motivations. Like, why do you want to be that investment banker? Like me in, in, in Hawaii out surfing that day, you know, making people ask the questions, why do right. I want to be a dentist? Why do I want to be a, right. you know, a business owner. Let me, let me evaluate my motivations. And yeah. then if it's, if it's clear and it's a good reason, like do it, but mm. maybe it's time to rethink that, you know, when yeah. you're doing through life. Right. So seek, seek what moves you.
So God, do you feel like God uses good marketing? Absolutely. Why, why can't he just use uh, just no marketing? Just he like, can't. Because can. I mean, in the, in the early church, there was no marketing. It's not like Jesus right. had like some kind of brand or something. Right. How well, do you make that connection? How do you make that bridge? I would say that Jesus had marketing. He had a forerunner who went before him. His name was John the Baptist, who wasn't the most like flashy guy, but he was pretty, you know, he was an attention he was getter. Target, but not Kmart. He was an attention getter. People from everywhere, it says, went out to the desert to hear John the Baptist, right? And he would proclaim the coming of the Lord. And you know that. So he did have a forerunner. He had a messenger sent before him. He went out of business. He got beheaded. <laughs> so in that sense, he was right? Kmart. <laughs> and if Jesus has a logo, like Kmart, though. and if Jesus has a logo, what is it? As a Catholic, it's the crucifix. As an evangelical Protestant, it's a cross, right? I mean, that really is... Yeah. The, the mark of a Christian is the cross. And the only reason we have the corpus, the body still on the cross, is because we believe it's a call that suffering is part of the journey, that the road to salvation is paved with suffering. And I think that you guys are, are missing out a little bit when it's just really cleaned up cross. I'm like, let's remember that he went there. No, he actually calls us to the cross with him. You know, he says, anyone who desires to come after me must pick up his cross and follow me. So, you know, 10 of the 12 disciples were were killed for their faith. They were all martyred. You know, it was, it was yeah. not like a clean thing. It wasn't like, oh, but you get to get off. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. I'm going to prosper you. And, you know, it's not, not, it wasn't a health and wealth gospel. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah, the logo would be the cross, which is, uh, you know, we're not trying to win friends and influence people here with that. <laughs> so you think that the cross was appealing to the people in the earliest centuries who were under persecution? I don't know, man. I think, I didn't, I think the people in the earlier centuries were given, the true God, were given that true gospel of like, it's a call. The resurrection to be, would be, to be a sign of contradiction to the, to the world. Yeah. And, and yes, there's resurrection hope, but oftentimes that's through suffering, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, right. There's there's a whole theology it's, built around. It's hard to it's hard to understand how that gets people in the door, though. I mean, it, I, think, I think suffering is because I think suffering is universal. Yeah. Okay. And I think you know you know Saint Augustine has a great quote. He says, "God made one son on this earth without sin, but not one without suffering." Mm. And I think that we can all relate to having a, a you know someone in the family who's addicted to something or someone who's committed suicide or someone who's depressed and on meds for anxiety or um, suffering a financial loss or having lost a job. And, you know, yeah. we all know people that are going through hard times and suffering and we're all suffering in our own way, whether, whether that was done, you know, through your own decisions or, or through right. someone else and you had no control, right? How many people do you know that were sexually abused? I know a lot. Um, you know, and yeah. so we all have these, this trauma in our life, right? It's yeah. all part of our human experience. Right. That's what I think is appealing about the cross. I think that's very appealing just that we, that we, we present a gospel that says, you know, I love that verse that says he was like us in all ways, right? He can sympathize with our weaknesses, you know, yeah, he was like us in all ways except for sin, but he can sympathize with us in our weakness. Like Jesus knew brokenness. Jesus wept. Jesus, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. There's something about his humanity that really is appealing. That he's that he's with us. Like that whole, we're coming up on Advent and Christmas, right? So it's like Emmanuel. You know, we always sing those, some of those songs. And Emmanuel means God with us. And I kind of feel like the, the rah, 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 you know, sometimes it comes from the evangelical corners is God is for me. If God is for me, who can be against me? Mm -hmm. Right? God's for me. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, he's for you. But I think more importantly, he's with you through all your shit. Mm. You know, good, bad and ugly. Like he's with you. <laughs> I think that's more important to me than him being for me. <laughs> you know, That's just me. Um, when you yeah. approach branding, like, do you ever get to a point where you don't know where to go? And how? Uh, what do you do? Is there a certain formula you go through or? There's certainly there's certainly tactics and um, strategic questions like differentiation is really important, right? Like whatever you're marketing, 
you have an audience, right? You have a, a body of prospects that you're trying to get in front of and reach. And all things considered equal with you next to someone else on the shelf, why should they choose you? And that really comes down to differentiation. How are you different? Right? How are you reaching out and grabbing their attention? Um, and, and you see this today lived out in lots of different ways. Like sonic branding is kind of a new thing. That's like an audible brand. So like when you, my YouTube TV starts, it's like, you know, it has a noise to it. Yeah. You know? like you think seinfeld do 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 right yeah Yeah, it's it's all seinfeld yeah right so the more visual we become as a culture where we're just watching videos like youtube shorts and youtube and and tv like you know um and it's so custom right with tiktok and instagram and like i think sonic branding is one way that companies are trying to consistently deliver the same sound over and over again so that you know like Bum, 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 bum. Do you know who that is? Farmer's Insurance. Uh, um, how about, uh, you know, I can think of a bunch of them, but, you know, like the McDonald's one, you know, we just did, ba da ba 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 right? Um, I can think of a ton of them. Out here in Denver, if you, if you remember the Shane Company, <laughs> one half mile east of I-25 on Peoria Street. Is that a jewelry? Street, is it jewelry? Right? Yeah. 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 I remember that. I mean, it's just, my, he just beats American that drum. Over and over furniture again. warehouse springs right. to you. Right. Or like, uh, you know, things yeah. like Geico. Right. And of course, these companies have like hundreds of millions of dollars that they spend on advertising. Right. 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 But Geico, right. Did you know that 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. How yeah, do I know that? Just off the right. top of my head. Yeah. Because I've heard it a thousand times. Yeah. Right. Here's a good, here's a good one. You're a racist, and that's the <laughs> that's the that's the Democrat Party branding. Because every time you hear that, you're like, "Oh yeah, I, I should become a Democrat." <laughs> right. So it's just yeah. like do 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 do. But we're we're Side off on, on a tangent. But my point is just differentiation is how is is one of the things you said. How to be successful, or do you, do you know where to go? I would say, hey, let's let's look at whatever research and insights we have on who you're trying to reach. What do they care about? Uh, what do they we'll, buy? We'll when do they that. buy? Yeah. Why do they do things? Right. Okay. So, so superior, Purpose. yeah, superior insight is the key to winning in in in, in marketing. So it's got to be differentiation, but then it's also that that thing that's unique has to be connecting with some need that people are willing to part money for. Yes. Like they, there's got to be some reason for them to reach in their billfold. Wow really dating myself Bill like Foles. when people say when they say tape <laughs> i'm taping this um you know reach in your wallet grab a dollar and yeah give it to you um there's something there's some reason they do that and they don't just do it randomly they do it for right. a reason and for a lot of nonprofits, for example like what is that why someone would give you know are you are you connecting with them from a giving level like if you're looking for donors Monthly so donors. If you want nonprofits give, need branding too, is what you're saying. Of course. They need messaging, branding. They need to tell the stories and show, not just tell, but show the stories of the impact that the ministry or their nonprofit is making. And then put those in short, snackable 30 second video clips, you know? Wow, snackable. One minute snackable. Make it digest, make it something I can consume quickly and make the connection of why I need to give. Yeah. So that when you send me that, you know, year end appeal in the mail or online or on a social ad or an email, uh, it compels me to want to respond, you know, and goes, gosh, you know, I, I love this ministry. I love what they do. They build wells that they're drilling for water for people that don't have any clean water. And for 50 bucks a month, I can get two wells done a year my, by myself, just by contributing 50 bucks a month. That's cool. I'm in, I want to know that. And so really the payoff is like kind of selfish. Like, I want to give so that I know I made a difference and not to say that that's the right motivation to give, but I think at a human level, we all want to know that we made some kind of an impact, you know? Well, of course. Yeah, of course. So, I, you don't want to, there's so much, there's so many ways to waste your money to waste 50 bucks. Right. So like one of our, one of our clients is reassure ministry. me. I'm not rate wasting. this. <laughs> one of our clients is, is a ministry. He's actually a Catholic guy who just shares the simple message of the gospel everywhere he goes. And he's invited to speak everywhere. And so we have a ton of footage of him and we make videos and social clips and are trying to get in front of younger audiences. Um, 
And so one of my one of my messages could be because he pays for advertising uh, on Facebook, let's say, or Meta, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we have like a, a paid social campaign. Let's say we put five thousand dollars behind it to get the message out of the gospel. I can actually go to his donors or to prospective donors and say, every dollar you give to support this is going to help 10 more people see the gospel and hear the gospel. So I don't love to mix money in the gospel very much, but like in that case, it's actually true because the more money they give, the bigger social ad budget we can have to so that more people can hear the gospel. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, yeah. So we're meeting people where they're at and where are people? They're right here all day long, every day. We got to be here. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, but they're here. Yeah. yeah. Right. You know, unfortunately people don't ride horses anymore either, but we had to embrace cars eventually, you know, like it's just change and it's hard, you know, it's hard for everybody, but we, we, we can't, we can't deny what we see happening in the broader culture. We got to meet people where they're at, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see what you're saying. So if you're uncomfortable with where things are at and you want to do things, do something to steer people in a healthier direction, you're saying you got to meet them where they're at first. And then yes, you got to figure out how to, well, I don't know what verb you'd say, but and, and I think that's manipulate kind of, them. <laughs> no, I don't think manipulate them. I think um, control them. I mean, was was Paul being manipulative when he said, I become all things to all men so that I might by all means save some? To Greeks, I become a Greek. To Jews, I act like a Jew. No. Was he just being a chameleon and being fake? I don't think so. I think for the sake of their soul, the he, was reason, making, he was changing himself a little bit. With whoever I, the only, the only with. reason I agree with you on that is because we know how Paul ended. If Paul ended in a really nice house and grew old and just had a great, awesome life and was rich, I think you'd have a different answer. But he was in prison and he died really horrible death. He got his head cut off. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I actually that's think the that challenge would be, I have. Is, I actually think that would be pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. It could have been but a it, lot worse. It was the horrible, were... If you knew that was ha- going to happen and it was certain, and it was not like the kind of prisons we have now, it was really bad. I mean, I th- I think you know, I'm I don't mean to sound too cynical, but ironically, <laughs> usually it's the business people that sound cynical. But it's it's, I think it's because we know how Paul ended that we we take him at his word on that. We don't think he was yeah. being manipulative. But I don't think that's fair to say that every pastor or ministry or leader out there who lives in a nice house or a decent house and provides for his maybe five or six kids or something, you know, like that he, that he was, that he got that through manipulation. You yeah. Know? I, I would just say, use a different example. I don't think Paul's going to be a good example for that. I mean, I I'm just trying to say, no, but no, but what we were talking about was yeah. marketing and, and marketing yeah. meeting people where they're at. Right. And so Paul, I think when he says, becomes all things to all men i think there's something in there about him trying to meet people where they were and so if you're greek right. he can be a greek to you if you're a jew he can be a jew to you he's going to meet you on common ground yeah. so that he can plant the seed of the gospel right you know what i mean like he's going to build a relationship first to some degree and then he's going to share the gospel with you right 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 he definitely you know, did that, that and that's where i was going with that is on the phones right like give them content like if we know kids are on TikTok all day, like this yeah. is something I'm going going on with one of my clients is like, I'm saying you got to be on TikTok. Well, why do yeah. I have to be on TikTok? I don't like that platform. I agree. Most of the content is terrible, but that's just, that's the very reason you need to be there because you're a completely alternative voice. So many of these younger generations have never heard the gospel. They don't know who Jesus was. And if we can, in some creative ways, share Christ with kids on TikTok, that's a win in my opinion. Mm. Yeah. The so phone, like the phone is neutral, whatever. man. It's neutral. It's not good or evil. It's neutral. Well, but the people's Republic of China is not neutral. 
and they Agreed. have their hands deeply into 5G and and Huawei and TikTok and I agree. That's my my concern is that these these companies, I mean the the type of surveillance capabilities that exist are not accidental. They're on purpose. Um, and I'm I'm concerned about where that's going. I, I don't think we're there yet exactly, but um yeah, yeah I, I mean I there's agree. concerns I, I, that I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. But again, right now those, the fourth amendment those, some of those apply. things are out of our control, Luke. Sure. You know, some of them. If, if you've ever them. read the whole like Stephen Covey, you know, um Seven yeah. Habits, he talks about circle of influence and circle of concern. Right. Of course I'm concerned that China's so deep into that and manipulating yeah. and controlling the message and figuring out what you buy, when you buy it, why you buy it, right? It's all about insights and research. Yeah, That's what it is. I mean, it's just trying to figure out how people behave. Yeah. And and I'm concerned about that, but I don't have any influence to change that. Yeah. I do have influence to change getting some of my Christian clients on TikTok to be sharing the gospel with the audience in sure. a creative way. So I want to invest my the, the limited time and energy I have into that. For a not, into my, not into my circle of concern that I have zero influence over and can't yeah. change that from up. Right, right. You know? Sometimes I wonder, though, like how much influence we really have. And I sometimes I wonder if we have more than we think. And because we just go along to get along, and that's a choice we're making, right? Um it's hard to it's hard it's hard to have a conversation like this because it seems like there's so many different things going on at the same time. We're talking about like marketing, nonprofit versus profit. That's all right. That's all right. Um, I know that YouTube, for example, um, they just took down one of one of the videos. <laughs> just really, a couple one of days your ago. videos. Yeah, yeah, cool. right before an election too, and it was a congressional candidate. They have a bra They're very brazen. Um, and I, I don't know how much of it is even conscious. I don't know if it's somebody complained or whatever, but the lady was, uh, I can't even say now, see, this is the censorship. I can't even say on here what they said we did because then it would be picked up and this would be removed. So we can't even talk about why they remove, why they say they remove things. It's that kind of thing I really worry about. It's what people don't see, but I don't think that applies to your TikTok example with the gospel. Um, but I guess I would just worry about someone who is relying too much on TikTok for like marketing, because if that, if there was a problem with that, then your whole company might be. Right. Damaged. Yeah, no. And, and in this particular example that I'm thinking of, it's just for outreach. It's just, right. Just for pure outreach. So it's pure outreach. I mean, why not the, just do it? Yeah, totally. You know? get it. And, yeah. I, and I do see that. And, and I think I get that from, St. Paul, because, you know, I was in Athens, Greece, and I actually went down to where he preached. Yeah. I was at, standing on Mars Hill. Yeah. And it was the coolest thing because, you know, he, he took note of the culture and all the, all the idols and all the gods, you know, but instead right. of like just railing against it all, he said, I saw one that said to an unknown God. Yeah. And now I'm here to tell you who that is. Right. So he took yeah. the culture. Very and then he used it as a way to get the gospel out. I gotcha. And I think that in, a, in our day and age, we have the same opportunities if we train our brains to look for them. We have the exact same opportunities that Paul had. How do we get trained in that? How do we? It starts with changing changing um, your mind, your mindset. I believe your mind can totally change. And, and I think that you can form new neuro pathways in your brain, actually. Your brain is, is moldable. It's, it's amazing. Um, your brain creates new brain cells every single day. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think that, you know. So all the pot smokers out there be, you know, just remember what he just encouraged. said. You could get more brain cells. <laughs> they, so, they're not all dead. So I would say like, you're going to, you know, the, the adage that you're going to find whatever you're looking for is, is the truth. So if you're looking for problems in your marriage and you train your mindset to look for problems in your marriage, guess what? You're just going to see the problems in your marriage. 
If you're looking for the blessings in your marriage and the good things about your spouse and you train yourself to see, look, start looking for good things, you'll actually start to see new good things that you didn't see before. And here's a good example of that for anyone who's listening out there. Look for opportunities. In other if words. you've ever had your heart set on a certain car, like when I was a kid, I really wanted a truck. I wanted a Toyota truck like Martin McFly had at the end of Back to the Future. He had a black Toyota Tacoma and a hot girlfriend. And I was like, man, I want to, I want to wake up someday and have that experience where I go out in the garage and there's this shiny black t- Tacoma that's all yours. Yeah. Well, when I had that epiphany, even as a young kid, I saw Toyota Tacomas everywhere. Uh. And they were already there before. I just wasn't noticing them because I wasn't looking for them. Yeah. Uh. And that happens today. I mean, if you if you say, hey, I really want a forerunner, and you'll just see forerunners on every corner. And they were already there, but now you're starting to look for them. So that's my point. How do we you ask the question, how do we train ourselves? You 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 just slowly start to, you know, cut out the noise and focus on a few things that you're looking for. And for me as a Christian, like I'm looking for opportunities to share my faith. And then you're gonna start being blown away by how many opportunities you have. And, and and that's advice too for, for like marriage, right? Like I could choose to focus on the bad or the good. I'm going to just choose the good. That's part of being made in the image and likeness of God. It's, it's our volitional will. It's a choice. You know, Jesus says one, you know, let it be according to your faith so often. Right. I, I love the old adage that says one man says he can, another says he can't. Which one's right? They both are. Hmm. Proverbs, Proverbs says, so as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And that's to some extent up to you. Yeah. Wow. As a creature made in the image and likeness of God with volitional will and creative power and energy to, to take dominion over the earth and subdue it beneath your feet. Like, I don't mean to overstep, but like, we're not. You know, because we're small, but he put you at the center of all this. It's hard for me to do. Um, I mean, I, I believe what you're saying. I, I, it's a hard, it's hard for me to take in because right. I, I am, I can be kind of my default can be pessimistic right. and sad. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I think um, it's important for us to, or now, do you think that you're just by default like a positive guy? Are you looking for opportunities? All the no, time? no, definitely not. But it did start in probably eighth grade when I started to pray to be more positive. Wow. Because I saw so much negativity in my family and around me. Wow. So much brokenness. I don't have a single marriage. My dad has five brothers, and my mom had four sisters and a brother, and not one of the marriages survived. Wow. Not one. Wow. And I just felt like it was a grace early on in my age where God said, you really need to pray for a different spirit because I have that same generational propensity to be negative at times. And I have prayed, you know, deliverance prayers over myself of breaking free from that bondage of even generational stuff over my family and Jesus name, you know, and in its, in its mindset. I mean, it really is like, you have to start to believe that because if you don't believe you have any power, you, you will never exert it. And, you know, I don't see myself as like a motivational speaker kind of guy, but that's when I get the most excited when I start talking about not settling for less than God's best in your life. Like truly, like what would it look like for you to live up to your full potential in God? You know, and I love the quote that says, your, your life is God's gift to you, Luke, but who you become is your gift back to God. That you have some say in who we become. Mm. And I do feel the Lord often saying, let it be according to your faith. I mean, he says that so often, right? The hemorrhaging woman touches him, you know, touches him. And he says, I felt power come out of me. Very like powerful, he shocked. Yeah. And everybody else was touching him and, you know, he had his disciples around him, like a large crowd, like bodyguards almost. But she touched the hem of his garment and he stops and he says, somebody touch me. 
I felt power come out of me. And he turns and he says, go your way, daughter. Your faith has made you well. Right. Not I made you well, but he says, your faith made you well. And the centurion, right? I mean, I don't, I'll get off my pulpit here in a second, dude. But like the centurion who says, don't even come into my house. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus right. says, I've never even found such great faith even in Israel. You can kind of just see, imagine Jesus' floor, jaw on the floor kind of. Mm-hmm. And he's, it says he was amazed by his great faith. Mm-hmm. And that and that, that very minute, his servant was healed. At that same yeah. hour. Yeah. So we got to operate in that zone, man. And it's so hard when you don't think things are going to change or my family's always been the same way or I've never made money before. How can I start now? Or whatever the lies are. Those are the mountains that Jesus said, if you say, I command you to go into the sea, those are the mountains that you need to command to go into the sea. And they will, if you ask in faith. But the reason we don't do that is because we're so afraid of being disappointed again. Mm. The reason we don't pray with expectation anymore is because we did before and God didn't answer so right. we, don't know, we don't know anymore what we can expect from him. Yeah. And so therefore we lower our expectations. We don't want to be disappointed. Right. We don't pray any bold prayers. Right. We, we want don't to reach out. To we, want to save cut, God, we want to save God face from not delivering. We don't reach out and touch the garment anymore. Nope. That's one of my favorite passages from Mark 5. Oh, isn't that awesome? Anyway, so that's kind of my message, man. Like if I if I speak or preach anywhere, that's usually my message is that you can change. It's not too late. Your family can change, your financial status can change, your living situation can change, your physical body can change. I don't care what rut you find yourself in right now, you can be in a different place. Six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months from now, in a completely different place. Without getting divorced without having to sell your soul, you can. But it has to start with you saying, I can. Mm. Which is sometimes the hardest thing for people to say, I can do this. We can do this. I'm going to start. And I'm going to start here with my mindset. Changing that. Changing the record that's been playing for years and decades of saying, you can't. It's always going to be this way. That's what we need to change. Stop the record. And I'm dating myself because I do have a turntable back here. <laughs> but that's cool. That's a cool dating. Yep. Yeah. But like, change the record, man. Change the, change the message. You know? And I know we went from marketing to that, but, you know, there is there is some, there is actually some, some crossover there with messaging and what are we saying, you know? Yeah. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be on with you. I loved having you on. I could, I could listen to you for a long time and I love your little quips that you have. You always have these quotes and little <laughs> short snippets that, that you people. When it sounds remember. true, I try to memorize it. When it rings true with my spirit and with my experience, I try to memorize it. Well, thanks for all of your time today and all your energy pouring into the TRP audience for the future. Thank you, Jer. You're welcome, brother. God bless you.